I need money. I need cash. And he said, you know, there's going to be a high percentage on that. I said, that's fine. He goes to his bedroom, comes back with a pillowcase and dumps a giant stack of thousand dollars and twenties rubber banded meticulously on the table. It's just big mound. And he says, you know what happens if you don't pay back this money. My guest today is Ian Bick. Ian is the host of the Locked In podcast. You've probably seen him on TikTok. He began his career as a party planner when he was just a teenager in suburban Connecticut. By the time he was 20 years old, he owned a nightclub and he was promoting big time rap concerts in the area. But things got out of control. He got arrested by the FBI. He took him to trial but was found guilty of defrauding investors. He spent two years in federal prison. This is a dork, okay? He did fed time, got out, he turned his life around. He is now a fledgling media mogul. And of course, if you want bonus content with Ian, head over to patreon.com slash The Connect Show for a full bonus episode only available there. You've got to go check out his podcast, Locked In. He's a good friend of the show, and we're here to get the entire story right here on The Connect. I was getting beat up a little bit, like the shady figures got me one day, brought me to the basement of the club, took the end of a screwdriver, the handle, pulled up my shirt, hands on my desk, and they're just whacking each finger, saying we want our money. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. Then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Surrey and Bick. Mr. Johnny Mitchell. It is great to be here. I am so happy to have you on the podcast. It's been a long time coming. Not going to lie, it's a little awkward since I do know you so well now and have heard your story in small clips and small bits. But I intentionally didn't pay a lot of attention to your story because I knew I was going to have you on the show and I wanted to hear it first, you know, how you came, how this all came to be. Because now you're like some big media mogul, you know? You got a whole prison brand, right? You're going you're gonna to start making clothes for inmates pretty soon. Good idea. Right? Oh, it's Bob Barker. Do you know who Bob Barker is? Of You're course, still a I used kid. to wear their clothes. That's right. You look on the on the, their the stitching. Too. Right. Yeah. Billions yeah. in the prison industry. But you you're you're the only person I know, the only dorkier kid than me. The only person that should have been in prison, deserved to be in prison less than me. And yet you got sent up to the feds and you got this whole story. Yeah, you're just you're just a hustler. You know, and I recognize that, you know, you're a chip off the old block. So I see that in you. You're like my little brother, you know, but you're like pushing 30. I mean, you look like you're 17 still. 28. You're 28. 28. So what's the deal? Are you Jewish? Half Jewish. Right. From my dad's side. So I know it's it religiously, it doesn't count, but we grew up celebrating the Jewish holidays, mm -hmm. um, you know, Hanukkah, Passover, yeah. um, Rosh Hashanah. And um, we celebrate Christmas too. My mom's side is um, Italian. Uh, I actually never really talk about this. This is it's interesting because Connecticut, where you're from, where we are, it's you know it's there's a lot of really ghetto, deindustrialized pockets of Connecticut, uh, but there's also you know uh, white collar, high end, you know business people that live here, and I assume you come from the latter. But you have the you have the you have the hustle of a uh, you know Jewish kids that I used to sell weed with back in Oregon, so that's why I brought it up because I'm like, there's no way this kid doesn't have a little bit of the uh, you know the tribe in him. I actually grew up in a gated Jewish community that was founded by Jewish firefighters. Um, <sighs> the whole neighborhood used to just be Jewish, and it was their summer homes. Um, and my dad grew up there. It's right down the road. You're and, kidding. Yeah. And then um, they it founded was, it. Yeah. It was like a kibbutz in Israel, but in <laughs> Connecticut. There's a synagogue diagonal 100 feet from my house um, that my dad's dad was one of the founders of. And um, I grew up in this neighborhood. We actually used to break into the synagogue and, and drink out of it. It wasn't really breaking in. The door was always unlocked, but they had this old, like, scotch and rum in there yeah. and we would go and we would drink we were teenagers and we thought that was cool yeah. and whenever we ran out of alcohol during a party we would go over <laughs> to the synagogue and just grab it um wow. but yeah that was that was my life yeah. growing up 
Yeah, that's it's so interesting. So you guys are entrenched. You go back here in the Connecticut Danbury area. Yeah, I never thought I would stay <clears throat> in Danbury, but I ended up coming back and, and living here after prison because we're in Richfield right now, but it's yeah. about one minute across to the Danbury border. Yeah. Um, this is like where my roots are. This is where it all started. And I think I want to, I want to finish it here, like finish what I started here. Right. Right. So what happened to most of your friends, by the way, so, <clears throat> so the culture, my point is the culture that you grew up in is very business minded. Like you were like a really focused guy. You're, you just take one foot after the other after the other, like you just do what's necessary if you want to become successful. Because to me, that's really what it is. If you can actually have the discipline to follow a structure and to stick to the script, you can become successful and wealthy. I really believe that. It's just most people lack that discipline and that sacrifice to, you know, go without now for greater gain later. I Sometimes I think I don't have it, but you are really, really, you just have that, that centeredness. So the question is like, how did it go wrong? I mean, that's a, that's a very, that's a big, yeah. and that's what we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. So what did your father, your father was in the catering business. He was actually a New York city public schools teacher then retired, you know, like seven years after I was born. Um, and then t took his side hustle, which was catering full time. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really got into like the event planning entrepreneurial mindset because right. he was a big time caterer in the city uh, doing stuff for like the Rolling Stones. I used to go to the Harry Potter premieres growing up. Um, he, he would come home one weekend and be like, yeah, I was just with 50 Cent doing a barbecue for him. Um, 50 Cent would do these like large barbecues over the summer for the whole the Bronx or Brooklyn or something like that. Um, and your dad would stuff. cater those? Yeah, he did Bill Clinton wow. uh, one time, the whole Secret Service ordeal with right. the, you know, that they mix up the plates um, when you're about to serve oh. them. My dad said, hey, give that one to Bill because it was the best plate. They said, absolutely not. Switched all the plates and then tried each and every one of them. Wow, in case it's poison. Yeah, they made them leave the room and switch every one of they them. They do that in America? Yeah. I thought that was just like in Saddam Hussein's <laughs> dictatorships. They do that. This was early 2000. This is after wow. Bill got into office and my dad has a picture with him. That's fascinating. Yeah, he got to meet them and, and serve them food and stuff. He's done a wow. lot. And uh, his old business partner was related to Giuliani. So yeah. the plan was that if Rudy Giuliani got into office when he ran, yeah. my dad would be the White House chef. Never happened, wow. but. <laughs> yeah, he's going to bring him food upstate now. Yeah. That guy's having some problems. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so you saw, you looked up to successful, you know, you had success in your family, you had hustle in your family. Um, what did most of your friends end up going on to do after I high school? I was always so different from my friends because one, I was always the hustler. Mm -hmm. Like I was a kid that did the lemonade stands. Mm -hmm. I tried making a candy shop in the woods across the street from my house, like chopping down the trees mm -hmm. and buying plywood until the city shut it down because wow. it was like, you can't illegally chop down trees. <laughs> right. I sold candy and energy drinks and gum out of my backpack in middle school. And I just always had this mentality to go against the crowd. Everyone was yeah. like, you got to get good grades to go to a good college right. and this and that. And I wasn't for any of that shit, yeah. but all my friends were, everyone wanted to be like a lawyer or a banker or this and that. And every single one of my friends went to college, except for one that I think left Westcon to become an airplane mechanic. Hmm. Great job working for Pepsi right now as their personal, you know, jet airplane mechanic. Right. But the 99% of the people I was in high school with went to college. And the crazy thing is the majority of them didn't even go into the field that they went to college for. What are they doing now? Um, the ones that went? or Yeah, the ones that went to college. Um, one friend's like an investment banker mm. type person mm -hmm. others are in you know realtor or lawyer or this and that and they're in that nine to five yeah. grind monday through friday mm -hmm. yeah you call them on a wednesday hey you want to get dinner no i can't i'm bogged down with work yeah. you know just a very very different mm -hmm. lifestyle than what yeah. i do well it's a lot like my story you know uh it's a little different like in portland you know it's not as affluent as you know connecticut parts of connecticut but it's much the same story you know everybody really you know, just bit the bullet and when got jobs and families and, you know, they seem very happy, but you just loved transactions. You know, you would have been a drug dealer. I promise you, if you had grown up in the time that I had in the environment that I did, you absolutely would have been, you know, 
selling weed out of your backpack uh, in science class. Right. But you like, you know, what was it about hustle? What, what, why do you like selling candy? Like, what did that do for you? You didn't need the money. It was never about the money with me ever. Even when I owned the club, it only became about money when I was in a hole and needed to make money. Yeah. But when I first started, it was just, I looked at it as a way to get attention to be different. Yeah. And I knew that with difference came attention. Cause that's when the spotlight's on you. I grew up not doing sports. I did theater, musical theater every mm. year. Yeah. Uh, every sub for summer camp, I did the play all four years in high school. I strived off of being different. And to me, that was the currency. It was never about the money. And that's what I liked. And that's what I, why I'm good at what I do now. Mm. And I just redirect that in a positive mm. way. So it was about your identity. Yeah. I think that's what I was because I was that nerdy, mm. not that I'm much different, but, um, nerdy, you know, chubby, kid before with the red rosy cheeks and yeah. just very nerdy and that was the one that idolized the popular girls and mm -hmm. could never get them and right. do all that right. and i wanted to become what all the friends that i looked up to were right because i could never be that back then right yeah everything man does is just a, trying to get that's all it is and that's all you were doing selling m&ms and bubble gum is trying to get attention just you know man and that's what Status is, you know, you could argue is what men uh, strive for because that brings power and, you know, women and and that keeps procreation going. Yeah. So that's that makes total sense. It's kind of how I was. Uh, I didn't do the things you did. I didn't have the I was I was much more sloppy. But, yeah, I get that. That's what drug dealing for me did. Because I didn't set out to think I could make millions, like especially not selling weed. I didn't. I didn't know how you, sixteen years old. I didn't know how you did that, right? I just liked being the guy that had it, you know. Um. So then you're in high school now. Uh. Are you a partier, drinker? I never got into liquor. I remember we would always buy Dubra. It was the cheapest vodka. We would oh, get yeah. so. <laughs> drunk and sick uh, but i yeah. was a kid that would pretend to look like he was drinking yeah. um to be cool you know and i was always <laughs> take a couple sips i'm already yeah. drunk i was never into weed i was the kid that did the fake smoking you know take a hit no one's looking you know cough it out or whatever <laughs> i did everything to feel cool i remember carrying around cigarettes for a little bit because i thought it was cool to carry a pack mm, of cigarettes mm. and carrying around the skateboard because that whole skater phase <laughs> I, di I put highlights in my hair and tried growing my hair out long, and I just oh, did all the. Yeah. Then yeah. I went through the preppy phase of wearing right. the polos and the and the cargo shorts and right. this and that. Right. But um, you know, it was I, I guess everything just fell into place where I did musical theater freshman year, and they asked me if I wanted to throw the cast party because the senior that used to throw it throw it just graduated. So I asked my parents, hey, can we like use our yard to throw the big cast party? This is mm. like a 300 person party. And uh, my dad got a tent through his company, a, a party, a wedding tent. We put a porta potty, a dance floor, a lighting, the DJ. Mm. And we had like 300 people in the yard and it was a success. Wow. And that just gave me a taste. Right. Like someone that hits a drug for the first time. This was holy. Everyone's talking about me. This is awesome. Right. You're getting pats on the back. Like, yeah. dude, you know, this is Ian's party. <laughs> Who's Ian? Yeah, I know. I didn't know he I didn't know he existed either. And I now was a, you exist. I was a freshman that the entire school was talking about. Right. You're McLovin. I was I never back then. Yeah. I became McLovin <laughs> in prison. But yeah, I was I was I was Ian. I was Ian Bick. Everyone yeah. always referred to me as Ian Bick. So that was your way in socially now as like the guy that threw the parties. Yeah. After that. The only I knew I had to wait till the following year to throw a party right. of that magnitude. So what do you do before then? Yeah, you start throwing house parties. Right. So it started. I remember my first party was like a New Year's Eve party that December. That was like 40, 50 kids, and then weekend after weekend they went from fifty kids to four hundred kids <laughs> showing up at my parents' house, and wow. I would lie to them and say how many kids were coming. Uh, they got so big we would have a bodyguard, like a, a bouncer, at the gate to the community with a, 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 a checklist and then kids would just wow. start breaking the gate to come through because it was like a wooden gate. And your parents would let this go on while they were there at the house? So a lot of the seniors worked for my dad's company, catering company. So I would have them go upstairs and schmooze my parents like with wine and, and whatever upstairs. Well, we just had these giant parties downstairs and they'd get pissed every time and say, you know, you can never have a party again. But 
I mean, ultimately they would say yes, and I was very persuasive. Mm. Um, and they um, they would rather me be at the house where they were more in control than me somewhere else. Yeah, they didn't know we were serving alcohol or anything. They right. never would have allowed that. But we had our, we have a patio by the lake. Yeah. We would set up a whole bar oh, and have one of the wow. high school kids work it and charge five bucks a cup. Wow, things like that. Wow, that's so fun. That's so fun. And anyway, how would you make money? Yeah, we would, we'd five, six hundred bucks. A lot of it just went back to the liquor. We'd make a little bit of money though. We'd have pong tables on the deck. We'd clear out all the f- furniture in the bottom floor of my house. Yeah. Um, my room was downstairs with the guest room. So my room became like the smush room. Uh, we would like when we saw whoever was a hookup of the night, we'd all press our ears against the door to, oh, to hear what was going wow, down. Wow, that's. And, um, dude. you know, and looking back on it, when you get older, people are like, how the f you let someone in your bed? No, um, dude, you, <laughs> you let some, someone in your parents' bed if you, yeah. if, you're, if you need to. This, That's a homie move. It, it was just, it was crazy. We put a fog machine in the kitchen. Um, and the thing about my parties is I always went over the top to entertain. We'd have candy. We'd have a, a variety of snacks, mixers, whereas right. you went to other parties, there was nothing. There was yeah. no mixers, nothing. It was like a right. hood party. Yeah. This was the spot to be, and yeah. it just it, it got crazy. Right, and that skyrocketed my popularity with the upperclassmen. I became the guy that was in charge of tailgates. They called me Mister Tailgate um, for our cheering squad. We would serve hot chocolate in the parking lot. We would get hot dogs, hamburgers. I started running the high school's proms. Um, I turned it into a business. I ran the high school's proms. I ran their homecoming dance. Turned the cafeteria into a nightclub put up pipe and drape, put up wow. furniture, got a DJ. We recreated the high school experience. And I was just like, there's money to be made here. Yeah. Um, wow. How'd you market yourself? Was there already like social media when you were in high school? Back then, it was all about Facebook yeah. invite pages. Uh, there was, And Twitter was big back uh, then. Right. Um, Instagram was just beginning. This mm-hmm. was like 2010, 2011. Snapchat was, I guess, kind of big, but not it, people were more just using it not for text. It was more for just photos mm-hmm. and like nudes or whatever. Right. Um, and there was no such thing as TikTok. No. Um, it was all Facebook groups. And the thing about Facebook groups and invites back then was that if you put out an invite page and invited 500 of your friends, the engagement was crazy. So if like 400 clicked attending, you would know 400 would show up. Right. Now you spam people with invite pages. Right. You, no one either clicks or, or whatever. It was right. a totally different concept yeah. back then. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, you're, and you're on the cutting edge. Like, look at you. You're already using, you're using everything you use now back then. Yeah. You're, you're learning about internet marketing. Uh, I mean, it's just like, it's a perfect confluence of things and it makes total sense. And your father comes from party planning. Uh, so now you're making a little bit of money, would you say? Like once you really got rolling, throwing different events, not just the house parties, how much are you making a month? So I made n- not really anything until I got to end of sophomore year, junior year, yeah. when I actually created a business out of it. Because then my parents said, listen, you really can't keep doing these large parties yeah. here. So I went and rented a theater in Danbury. It was this historic palace theater that my dad knew the landlord and I changed it into a nightclub for the night, the lobby. Had like five, 600 kids, charged 15 bucks a ticket. We called it the end of the year blowout, got a DJ, police officers, bouncers, made it look like a real nightclub. Mm. Um, I made like 1500 bucks. How do you make money selling alcohol, I assume? No alcohol, no it's alcohol. all off ticket sales. That had to be strict, run legitimately. Right. Cause you can't serve a bunch of underage kids alcohol, especially when you have police yeah. guarding the place. Kids would pregame in right. the parking lot. Right. Or maybe sneak stuff in, sneak yeah. in, you know, bottles or whatever. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh, okay. Yep. So we, you charge, you know, 15 bucks a ticket or mm. whatever times, however many kids minus your expenses, that's your profit. Right. Um, and we included, like, we made like a lot of mocktails, Shirley temples, everything like that. The landlord said there was too much liability doing that. So that was a one and done thing. And that's when I stumble upon this world of nightclubs in Danbury <laughs> at 16 years old. The first one I go to, the owner gives me the runaround, says he's booked for the next six months while like fakely looking at his calendar that was empty. So I go across the street and I land at this place called Tuxedo Junction, historic rock club that competes kind of with Toad's Place in mm. New Haven, which is another historic club. Tuxedo Junction's had Oasis there, big, big names. These are these are 
rock clubs? Yeah, these were okay, rock, but gotcha. they also did hip hop acts. They had like Meek Mill there. <laughs> right. Chris Webby was a big performer there. Right. Uh, French Montana played there. Yeah. And then they used to do teen nights. There was this whole thing before my time called teen nights where you would get all the high school kids to go. And it's like a high school dance without the chaperones. So girls are getting on the oh, dance floor. Dude. Guys Those are, are the, 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 the twerking, the, <laughs> the music and everything like that. So I end up working a deal with the, the owner of the, of tuxedos to let me rent the front room for the night because he wouldn't give me the big room because the big room could hold about 1,500 people. They give me the front room on a weekday, which was like a Wednesday during the summer. It could only hold 200 kids. Mm -hmm. We ended up packing that <laughs> with like three or 400 people, no <laughs> promotion. And that's when he said, holy, <laughs> you could have as many dates as you want the big room. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So off of 400 people, what are you clearing? I made that one. It was cheap. It was like five bucks to get in minus expenses. So I made like 800 bucks. The real money came when I started doing, I came up with this idea to throw raves. Mm. So I called it the Halloween rave, the Christmas rave, things like that, a paint party rave. Mm -hmm. And I was the first person to mix electronic dance music with like hip hop music in our town. It was exploding in the city. Avicii, this was 2011. Yeah. Avicii was big. All these big names, Alesso. It was right. selling out Day Glow Life in Color at colleges. And Danbury hadn't experienced that yet. So I start doing it. And I start making $10,000 to $15,000 profit once a month. Wow. Getting kids from the tri-state area. Wow. that And just marketing through socials and now probably word of mouth too. Guerrilla marketing was big. So we took flyers. You'd get 10,000 flyers printed for a couple months. You'd go to the top of the staircase in every college and or every high school. Yeah. Right before the bell rings, you drop all the flyers down the staircase and it sprays everywhere. <laughs> and that works? It, had, it would have my Twitter <laughs> name on it and my Instagram name. At Ian Bick, the day of the party, the price, and the time. There was no such thing as pre-sale tickets back then for these types of things. Everything was day off. So if it rained or snowed, you were screwed. Right. But this was all like the power of this, of flyers. Yeah. Like we would go to parties and put them on the car windshield. Yeah. Everywhere. It would have a flyer branded. I called myself, this is where it's at productions. Because if our parties were going to be where it was at for the night, it was a play on words. This thing just exploded into a business. Wow. So And that, so that really works. Even in the digital age, paper flyers work. This was, you But know, also it's years. high school, too. Yeah. You're doing it in a, in a place where, you know, 16, 17-year-old kids have nowhere to party. And the you know? lockers had slits in it where you put the right. flyers in right. it. Right, right. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's kind of how I treated selling weed when I got to college. I'm like, this is a contained space. So I don't have to go to the outside world and have to start like exposing myself to try to market my product. Everything, it's 20,000 kids in one area, right? Yeah. And they all got government money and no jobs and want to get high. It's like the projects, but like for rich kids, right? So it, there it's easy in an insular world with a bunch of people to market and sell. So you're kind of doing the same thing with party promoting. Uh, so now you're 17. Yeah, I'm about, I'm 16, 17. It was, it was like junior year of high school. And, and I was when doing you, this. and you know how to like talk to older people. You already know you have this assuredness to you. Like you can go up to the owner of a nightclub and do business with them. How do you get them to take you seriously? So at this time I I'm running this business and I'm also running a nonprofit, not a real nonprofit, but in my head, because I had gotten into some trouble. That's how this whole thing starts. I get into trouble, get court-ordered um, community service. So I start this thing called Fight for the Homeless. And how did you get in trouble? Me and my best friend <laughs> took insulating foam and sprayed the car handles of the president and vice president of our community's cars one night, mischief night, 2010, mm. because they made a rule saying... 16 year olds, 15 year olds can't drive golf carts. I had a golf cart and we can't drive dirt bikes and we can't play paintball. So we retaliated. Sure. And foamed their cars. It caused five grand worth of damage. We got caught and got community How'd service. How'd you get caught? Cameras? So they knew we, I was called the black sheep of this Jewish community. So the cops came right to us. And that night I'd like toilet papered our own house thinking, Hey, we got hit too. <laughs> um, so I like that. my parents are, um, my dad thought, you know, he answered the door and he thought his kid couldn't be an idiot and would have disposed of the evidence. 
<laughs> so he says, sure, you can look around. They go in the garage, and what do you find in the garage? Six cans of the foam still wet dripping down the can. Um, oh. And then they did the whole, to my friend, hey, your friend snitched on you, and he admitted to everything. Oh. So wow. we, we were toast. You got your first you got your first taste of getting ratted on. And I really should have I never put the pieces together until afterwards of mm-hmm. going through that whole experience. But I always knew at a young age, never rat, you mm-hmm. know, never talk to the cops like that when you're in a position like that. And I didn't apply my own knowledge when I went through my own criminal enterprise because I, I always see the good in people. Mm-hmm. You know, so I always I never thought it would happen. But back then at that time, as a kid, I watched enough Criminal Minds and CSI to know you never talk to the police. And that's a, a great tactic they use about the old flipperoo. Right. <laughs> so certainly don't let them in and let them search. You yeah. Know? But that's how white people think about police. Like they're treated so much differently than the black community because, you know, we grew up hearing from the older people when it came to like interactions with cops. Just tell them everything. Tell them everything and everything will be fine. But with black people, it's the opposite. It's like everything will not be fine regardless. So don't say and we'll try to get you a lawyer. You see the difference? Yeah. Like it's a it's, you know, for me and for probably for you, when you're not brought up uh, knowing how to be a criminal and, and being looked at as a criminal by society, it, it takes you, it throws you for a loop when you do get in trouble. I mean, you're like, God, you're scared. You're like, God damn, like this can't happen to me. And so you don't know how to act and you do things that go against your, your own interests. Yeah. I have no problems with cops whatsoever, but I will not talk to them without a lawyer. Present. But you're smart about that though. You you were, you had I, I more learn a, now. Right. After going before then I would do whatever. Yeah. But now after everything, even if it's a casual thing, because now I know they, they always have an angle. Yes. Whether it's bad or good, you don't know it at that moment, but there is an angle. Roger King, this anonymous black guy that I knew in the county jail, I was going through my discovery paperwork and I'm like, I actually looked at him and was like, there's no way the cops would lie in the discovery paperwork. He goes, that's their job. They're trying to get you. They're allowed to make story. They're allowed to lie to you to get you to trip over your own feet, right? And confess. They're able to do, they're allowed to do, they're allowed to fake who they are. That's what undercover police work is. He was like, of course they can tell you lies and subterfuge and, you know, give you fake names and posture as somebody else. That's what they're paid to do. And I was like, God, I am such a white boy idiot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you get in trouble. You do stupid. These you're like a hooligan. You have this like hooliganism in you. You notice that? I hated authority. Right. I didn't like when someone said I couldn't do something Mm -hmm. because there was silly stuff. I was like, don't wear flip flops in school. So of course I'm going to wear flip flops. They said no backpack. So I started a backpack petition. Or backpacks to school. I right. did stuff like that. Yeah. It wasn't like, don't, I, I, I wasn't a thief. Like someone didn't say don't steal. And then I went and stole. It was never like that. You know, Yeah. it was just petty rules that I didn't see. Like, I felt like I needed to be like Robin Hood, I guess, in that sense or whatever, just mm. to go out there and break down those barriers. Yeah. It was like that whole, you know, you have to go to college to be successful. Right. And I was that person that was anti the normal route. Did I, you? Did you not even have plans to go to college in high school? So freshman, sophomore year, I was so dedicated to getting into the FBI. And I had done all my research that you had to get be top in the class. You had to get into a great school. So I wanted to go to like Cornell or something like that. And I was top of my class, like top 10 AP classes by sophomore year, all A's. I fucking cried if I got like an A minus <laughs> or whatever in a class. So dedicated. And when I started down the party route, that all changed. Because then I got obsessed with business and the art of business and the art of putting things together, Mm -hmm. not the money aspect, but just the art of putting it all together. I love the process. Mm. I hated the parties themselves, but I love the buildup. I love the people talking about you. Hang on. So this is interesting. Why did you hate the parties themselves? I just didn't have fun. I was not a drinker. I Mm. wasn't a smoker. And I was always under pressure. 
to make sure no one got hurt. Right. Everyone, I, I was obsessed with making sure everyone had a good time. Mm. I didn't want anyone to say th anything bad about the party. Mm. And you're only as good as your last event. Right. So I need to make sure, but I wasn't, it wasn't until like the last couple parties I hooked up with a couple girls, mm. whatever, but I was so shy too. Right. Like for someone, you asked me about how I felt comfortable talking to these people. I wasn't. I was always nervous around them. I just, I pushed through. I'm the kid that's afraid of heights and roller coasters, yeah. but I still go on it and push through it. And that's a big lesson. That's a big life lesson for anybody. Anybody listening, I have to remind myself of that, you know, because I'm fearful all the time and, you know, in show business, right? Like you're just, you're constantly uh, worried that it's all going to fall apart. And yeah, it. as long as I do the thing I'm afraid of, I generally find at the end of the thing, I'm just happy that I did it, regardless of the results. Today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is America's number one online therapy. It's the holiday season and we're all depressed. The world is on fire. The economy is getting ready to return to 1930s conditions. Your money buys you a 20th of what it used to and everybody... Uh, is feeling like they need somebody to talk to. I go to therapy every week, you guys. I love therapy. Uh, I've been through a lot of trauma. I am very stressed out with my business. And sometimes I just need uh, an ear to talk my problems out. So do you guys. And that's why I cannot recommend BetterHelp enough. Check it out. If you haven't used it before, if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. It's very awkward when you first find a therapist and you don't really jive with them. You have to fire them. With BetterHelp, it makes it incredibly easy, seamless, and not awkward at all. Okay? Right now, if you go to betterhelp.com slash connect, you will get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash connect. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. So you're worried about the pressure though when you're throwing these parties. So you're very much business. Like you, you're, you're a kid, but you have the responsibilities of a man. I had a lot of responsibility. Mm. I was always under constant pressure to make sure my parents were happy, which they were mad at me every time. Mm. And I also, I was a kid that cleaned the whole thing up the next day too. Mm. Yeah. I was always putting it back together, cleaning it up, didn't really get any sleep. I was always just the entertainer. And I was also, I hated rejection, which is why I never really talked to women or anything in high school. And it wasn't even until recently where I'm like way more confident now and like podcasting and what I do now has helped me with that. But I was always just very unconfident with myself. And yeah. I think meeting you like a few months ago helped me gain a lot of confidence too. Cause I see a lot of like, like the way you operate, you're like, who gives a like we were talking about something and I asked you a question. I forgot what it was, but you're just like, just do it. You know, like, yeah. just like, you just have to shoot your shot. You have to do this. You have to do that. Yeah. So. It doesn't much matter at the end of the day, you know, and you know, going through a lot of real problems puts these problems in perspective, you know? So yeah. So you're 17 now you got in trouble, but that's not, you know, any kind of criminal trouble. Or did you have to go to court? Uh, we went to, it was like juvenile court, but it got expunged after because right. we did the community service. We were selling wristbands for a dollar for the local homeless shelter. Wow. Okay. So um, you're running this, you're running the nonprofit yeah. as like community service. Uh, you're party promoting. How does it step up from, you went from house parties to rock clubs. What's the next level? So by this point, raves, this is, I'm yeah, sorry, this is junior year of high school. Um, I'm wearing a suit and tie to school, carrying around a briefcase. Like a Mormon. Yeah. Thinking that it was the, the most hideous suit ever. It was a cheap suit, uh, a funky tie because my dad had a tie collection. And I just, I, I said, that's the business look, you know? Mm. And um, I'm doing that. I get an LLC. I LLC my company. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just navigating it and learning about business and obsessing over like guys. I was a kid that would uh, post quotes about like Mark Zuckerberg and stuff on my Instagram story back or the, there was no stories back then. So it was yeah. the feed. Yeah. Um, I would do things like that. And I was just like that nerd that everyone knew. I would be in the middle of a classroom and I'd get a phone call from a venue and I would just 
tell the teacher I have to take this. That's I was just so like, cool. Though. I was larger than life. Like, like, and that became hip. It, it suddenly became trendy to be a nerd who had business, who had uh, a nerd who didn't care became the cool guy. Yeah. So you hit it at a perfect time. And then I'd get a detention and I figured out how to get out of a t- detention. I'd text my dad and he would then say, he would call them and say, hey, I'm calling my attorney if you do not release my son from detention. Wow. And it worked every time. Wow. So your dad kind of enabled you in a way. He was a gangster, you know, yeah. like he was a, yeah. he, he taught us like independence mm-hmm. and like, I'm very different than my brother. Mm. Um, but he, he definitely helped create me, but I don't put any blame on him. Like some people put blame on him and stuff. Like if I had went and asked him for help, then he would have showed me the right way of doing things. I was just very stuck. I'm a very stubborn individual Mm. and I have to learn through things and figure things out on my own. Now, as I'm older in life, I'm better at asking people for help and Mm -hmm. not jumping into something I don't know without getting that proper help. Right. You learned a big time lesson. So let's get into that. So then uh, you formed your LLC now, your business. Take us from there. Well, what happened was is that those club owners, Mm -hmm. club owners are shady individuals and they're they're all about money. So there was a hundred other kids that wanted to be like me. Right. At this point, they saw the money I was making. So the club owners are now renting it out to anyone and their mother that wants to throw a teen party. Young kids, because there's no such thing as social media brands for what, there, there was no like followings, like a, an influencer back then. Mm-hmm. No one knew what was the difference between an Ian Bick party and a Joe Schmo party. <sighs> so these parties all suck. No <laughs> one's going, right. the market's oversaturated. Of the brand. Brands that mm-hmm. up, you can't do anything. People are like handing out flyers after other events. Everyone's on to what I was doing. The gig's up. You know, it's over. You can't make any more money. And so at that point, I got bored anyways. I Mm. wanted to take things to the next level. I had just decided I wasn't going to college, and I wanted to jump in to this business full time. I wanted to be a concert promoter. I idolized Scooter Braun, who was Justin Bieber's manager. Yes. Read about him, what he was doing. We actually worked with them to get Asher Roth. Asher Roth was my first big act I ever booked. He came for a charity show. Coolest dude ever. He was, Asher Roth was founded by Scooter Braun and and helped him um, through that whole thing. And and then, you know, Scooter did the Bieber thing around Mm -hmm. that time. But um, that was my first concert and I wanted to be a major concert promoter. I wanted to be the Scooter Braun without the managing acts. Right. I just wanted to do the concerts. Right. So that's a tough business, isn't it? So tough, but I- Never, I was naive and I just figured, okay, you get 5,000 people at $30 a ticket. There's all this money. Yeah, There's right. so much money to be made. I don't know about the video wall, yeah. the expenses yeah. and this and that that right. come with it. What was your first success? So I went from this kid that was super successful in high school, making all this money to someone that was like way in over his head at senior year. I had these business partners from the town over Richfield, the town we're in now that were in my grade, and uh, we ended up doing a Big Sean concert. That was my first major act that mm-hmm, I did. Mm-hmm. We did Big Sean. And how do you get a hold of these people? You hit up their agents or something? So how back do you organize then, that? we were talking about this earlier in the sense where you want uh, you want to get into something, but you have to have experience to get into it. Yeah. So in that world, you can't book a big act without having already booked a big act. Right. But it's impossible to book a big <laughs> act. Exactly. Um, so we had someone that was um, this guy called Big Mike in Danbury. He was French Montana's DJ. He was in the big world of mixtapes, had clout with MTV, whatever. He had a connection somewhere along the line to Big Sean. He booked it for us and got us our first foray. And once you start doing shows, you could kind of build up a roster. They had actually did it. My partners did it behind my back um, because they wanted to take – the show idea, and they put up the money for it. There are these rich white kids in, in, in Richfield. They put up the money for it. Um, but then they realized how the hell were they going to market it? I had the marketing capability. Mm-hmm. So they had to bring me back in, but I wasn't an investor, um, which worked out because the show lost money. Wow. But we did Big Sean at the Danbury State uh, um, College, Western Connecticut State University, as their fall show, their welcome home show. 
we only had three weeks to promote the show yeah. and it only sold like 1300 tickets for a Grammy nominated artist. Cause we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Wow. And he was huge at that time. 2011, that was 2012. Peak. Yeah. He had just dropped ass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how much do you lay down? What's your overhead on a show like that? A show like that was, I think that one was 80 grand. Wow. Going into how it. How much do you have to pay Sean? Big Sean, show. we paid 40 for that. Um, so for a show like that was about 80, but then it shot up to like 120 the night before because no one read the rider, the hospitality rider about <laughs> what he needed. That was another couple grand. The video wall, we didn't know we need that. That was 10 grand. Then the venue with union labors. Every hour they're over, you're getting dinged totally, at excessive totally. rates. Yeah. So if things don't go according to plan, like it's never what it was. And I was a person that everything had to be a certain way. Yeah. So I have it planned to the T. But I'm never thinking about what could go wrong. Yeah. You know, like what are the what ifs? I never thought about what could happen if I do this. It's always like this is gonna go perfectly. Mm -hmm. so and it never th does. Thirteen hundred tickets uh, is how much money? So I, I th there were different staggered ticket prices, yeah. but I know everyone lost about fifty percent of their or sixty percent of their investment because the guys I was working with put up ten grand for whatever their share mm. was, and they got back about four. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they took a beating. Took uh, a bath on that. On that show. Yep. Yep. So, so we're thinking, okay, we regroup. They apologized to me because we had other partners too. That a guy that was in Rhode Island and different people in the industry were like, we could do this on our own. Yeah, like we can run this better. We have right. our first show. We know what to do. We have the connections. One of my business partners who had got us um, Asher Roth, he says I could get us Wiz Khalifa. So Wiz Khalifa is, and he was enormous. He was even yeah, bigger back then. Huge. So we're thinking, great, we could do this. And he's like, okay. We could get Wiz for 80K, but you need to show proof of funds right. in a so bank account. Do you like hit up CAA or their reps? How do you get a hold of them? At that point, no. I've never worked with an agent before. Later on, I'll start doing right. it as I know how the business works. How'd you get a hold point, of Wiz? So my business partner is saying that he has a connection with Wiz that only he has, never shared it with us, nothing. And he says, hey, you need to show proof of funds, money in a bank account mm -hmm. with a statement. Mm -hmm. We need $120,000 to show proof of funds that mm -hmm. we had enough to get the show rolling with deposits. Right. right. And where was the venue? What was the venue going to be? The same college okay. in Danbury. Gotcha. It holds about 5,000 tickets. We set all together, whatever, it could gross about 250000 300000 Huge profit. Wow. If we, get, if we yeah. sold that, that's at every tier. Yeah. 20, 25, right. 30, 35, $40 tickets. Yeah. So it's feast. It's famine, but it can be feasting too if yeah. you win in the promotion game. Concert business, yeah. huge payouts yeah. if you yeah. can win. A if you of, sell every ticket mm -hmm. and it goes accordingly. Yeah. A lot, of, so lot of drug money gets pushed through those those kind of businesses. And I realized that later on when I was dealing with drug dealers that would help me fund That's right. as for money laundering mm -hmm. to help me fund concerts. Yeah. And it's a good way, you know, if you're a drug dealer with hundred thousand dollars you need to, you know, wash, even if you lose money, which is likely in the concert business. You you know even if you lose thirty grand on a hundred thousand dollars worth of drug money, that's still seventy thousand. You can now show as a statement, like make show legit. You know. Yeah, because a lot of these artists like Tyga, we paid him twenty grand over a wire when we booked them, but then the other twenty k was cash. Right. They're not reporting that exactly. So the drug dealer gives me twenty grand. I pay Tyga. Wow. And then Tyga reports twenty to the IRS, and then the other twenty, his manager's taking. Five probably for mm -hmm. that day, five yeah. or ten. Mm -hmm. Tyga gets a twenty from the agency, pays yeah. out his agency, and then the other ten is cash. Totally. And, and in the rap world and the drug world, let's be honest, we all know those are like, you know, jelly and peanut butter. Those are right next to each other. So, okay, tell us about that. The drug dealers that would they approach you? So when I got into hot water with my business, when I raised all this money and lost it all on concerts and this electronic business, mm -hmm. I started. I owned a nightclub at 18 by this point. This okay. is later on. By the way, how did the Wiz Khalifa show go? It never happened. Okay. Why? He backed out or? Um, no, my friend never had the connection. Uh. So he lied to us. And at this point, I had raised $120,000 from friends and family. Wow. And I guaranteed them all their money back, even if the show lost. That's how I raised the money. I, I got a contract off of LegalZoom, and I walked around with a contract that said, Hey, invest in this concert. And the only reason why this worked is because I already had a reputation that I was the party whiz kid and that I was the next mm. big entrepreneur. The news was writing good articles about me and I had that potential to be that next person. Mm. 
So that's why p- people believed in me. Right. And I was so able to raise that money. So you were raising money like an equity fund. Yeah, I looked at myself as a hedge fund. Yeah. I was the hedge fund and I would invest the money. Right. So, but they all got their money back. You didn't have to lay any money down, did you? No. So what happened was when that show went bust, we went to the investors and said, hey, it didn't happen. If mm-hmm. you want your money back, you could take it or leave it in with me and mm-hmm. we'll do other shows. About half left it. Right. And that's when we went and booked a string of shows in Rhode Island, Connecticut, um, New York of smaller shows. Right. And, and so you, you built up a little resume. Of- yeah, essentially. But that's when I started booking acts, working with CAA, mm-hmm. working with, um, um, UTA was, yep. was starting at that yep. point, different agencies, yeah. uh, WME. I, you know, people just so they know you can go to IMDB pro and if you want to book Madonna, literally Madonna. If you have $2 million, they all have prices. So if you, I'm a king of, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, and I'm like, I want to see Whitney Houston. I don't care if she's dead. I want her. You can look up her agent online yeah. and get them on the phone and be like, I have 5 million bucks. I'd like Whitney Houston's dead body at my my daughter's sweet 16 or whatever. Half of these agents don't answer, though. Like, none of the agents answered me. Until I could email them saying, hey, I booked Big Sean, right. this person, this person, this person. Right. Like now, if I hit up any agent and said, hey, I worked with all these acts, they would most likely respond. Right. right. But back then, they wouldn't unless you had those connections. Right, right. Or a proof of funds. Exactly. Perhaps. So, okay, great. So you now you're getting in with the institutions and your momentum's building. Uh, is how, how does it start to get shady? Like where, what, what are the holes in your operation? Well, the holes was that I got lazy. I always found success in doing the teen parties on my own. I was in control. Mm-hmm. I managed everything. I did the work. It, I created success with that. Mm-hmm. When I started raising money from people and then entrusting other individuals, other promoters, other people, it became out of my control. And I had thought I had already make, made it. Mm-hmm. When you're 18 years old, 17 years old with $120,000 in a business bank account, with my own office, you're thinking you're gold. You're, you got to yeah. be doing something right. Mm-hmm. So I got lazy and I mm-hmm. trusted a lot of individuals who did not have the same work ethic and the shows tanked. Okay. And after the first one, this is where things turn. After that first show tanked, I was naive and thought a couple things were going through my mind because I was getting information that the shows were doing well. And I had never seen ticket sales. I didn't see anything. So... I lied. Why, to, were, why wouldn't you be looking at that stuff? I never asked. Ian, I, I'm shocked. I was not, I was lazy. I took everyone at their word. If you said, Ian, give me a hundred grand, I'll turn it into 200 done. Like I was just, I believed everything. Well, you weren't on the ground at the shows looking at, no. looking at the, why? I went to the shows themselves. Yeah. But looks are deceiving in the concert industry. Mm. You could, um, when I owned the nightclub, I could realize a room with 500 could really be less than that or, or vice versa. Like there's, there's smokes and mirrors. It's different. It's like in comedy, you know, when you're in a comedy show, you can make with a camera, make it look like it's a packed room mm-hmm. and there could be 20 people there. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's very, it's, 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 it's mind boggling mm-hmm. what could happen. So that first show, I felt bad when I found out that the show lost money and I made the decision. I could either a tell my friends that it lost money, but they're going to think I'm stealing from them because they came to the show and it looked packed and everything looked good or, and I wouldn't be portrayed as a success or B I could lie and, and say it made money and hope the other shows would make money. Hang on, hang on. So, and this is, and, and this is where the moral decision, you know, you took this path, Yeah. which no judgment, but this is a key choice that was made. Uh, what show did you lose money on? What show are we talking about? This was Rusco, the DJ Rusco. We booked him at University of Rhode Island. Gotcha. And you had had that hundred and twenty thousand raised, or and I how- put twenty thousand of that hundred and twenty thousand in this Rusco show. And but- I was told that it was selling well; it was going to be great. So I got a limo, got a hotel, and grabbed like five of my friends to go out and see this show. Right at the show, everything looks great. I'm pa- partying with college kids as a seventeen year old. Right. Looks awesome. It's in this big arena, but which is only half filled, but they use like pipe of drape to look at it. Right. One of the partners of the shows comes up to me that night and he says, man, we took a beating on this. And I'm like, what do you mean? That's when he tells me about that we didn't sell enough tickets, not enough time to market, mm-hmm. extra expenses with the venue, all of this happened. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And that next day is when I made the decision that I didn't want my reputation and that whole image of me Mm -hmm. to be a failure. And I just figured, okay, we have six other shows booked. We'll make this money back. No problem. I'll eat the 20K. It's just 20K. I told the investors, we not only did we, they get their 20K back, but it made like six grand or seven grand. So now I'm in the hole for 27. Out of that 20K investment, I got back $2,000. So it's 18K, give or take. And change. What Plus, if they what if they had called called you on their money? What with, if they said, Okay, great, I'll take my return now? Well, so the contract was to be paid out the following month because we knew the ticket sale money, this it had to go through hands. Right. Right. So I got the two grand back or whatever. But right. so now I'm in the hole for twenty five when I'm I only got back two. Mm-hmm. So I'm in the I'm in the hole for whatever that math was. So then you said, I'm gonna go, that's okay. The next shows will make that twenty five grand back plus or whatever. Some. Plus some. They all tanked. Wow. How many shows did you do? There were, I think there was like six or seven. <laughs> and one show was I was in charge of at New Haven. That lost that the closest win we had was that lost two grand. Wow. One company, this electric foam fest company at U, uh, UMass, robbed me for twenty K. Never heard from them again. Just robbed me. I invested the money, never saw it. Nothing. We tried to sue him, and then the lawyer fees ate like ten grand. Right, right. So lost money. Snowstorm on another one already paid for everything in full, so got no money back on that. Another one was just failure after failure after failure. Oh my god! So yeah. you're you were sucked at this business. Yeah, you should have stuck to house parties and I selling stuck candy. Teen nights. If I had just did the <laughs> teen night business and squirreled the money away and got into real estate, <laughs> we would be. Yeah, you'd here. own this whole building. Yeah. Wow. I would have made so much money, man. Dude. Well, it was you know. terrible. So you lost. So now the whole 120 that was in the fund. I didn't have the 120 because I gave back some of it. I had about 70, 60 to 70. Okay. When you say gave back some of it, I called an investor meeting after Wiz Khalifa and said, "Hey, it's not happening." Okay, right. Yeah, so and I had some about people 65. wanted out. Yeah. Okay, got it. But then 65 quickly, you lost 25 on the next show. Out of that 65, yeah. I invested. I think I got back like 10 grand. Mm-hmm. So I'm out. 55, right? Right. But that's not the worst part. I promise people that each show is making money. I'm lying because once you tell one lie, you got to keep keep of it course, up. Of course, of course. They're all making money. This image is success. I keep banking on the next one right. to do well. Now, is that a federal crime already? Uh, is that investor uh, fraud technically? or So technically whenever, so the way wire fraud works is that you have to lie on the premise to get the money. So that I don't necessarily would have been fraud and I never got charged for this aspect. They had already handed me the money and I just lied about the return part. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been more of a civil case Mm -hmm. because that was all legitimate. Like I didn't illegitimately spend that money. Right. This was 2012. I'm 17. It wasn't even really legal that we all signed contracts. Um, That never got charged later on. This was just me lying about the losses, but I invested every dollar of that money I got. Yeah. No, you didn't take it and go buy a summer home. No. You, you, it was a business deal. The investors knew the risks. Yeah. And you just lost. That's and what happens in business. I promised on the contract that they would get their money back at the minimum. Do you think that was a mistake? It was, but I, honestly, that would have just been a civil thing. If everything ended right then and there, right. if I had just fessed up and said, hey, mm-hmm. I lost your money, if they even pursued it, because we're not talking about a lot of money, it would have been civil. Right. There and and who are fraud. these people, by the way? You say they're family, friends. Who, who Who's invested with you? My aunt and uncle put up $10,000. Um, my dad put up like 10,000, my business partner's parents put up 10, 15,000 and then friends, what, cause I wanted one investor for the whole amount. And I realized I didn't know anyone with that kind of money. So I went to a bunch of people. I had friends putting up a grand all the way up to 10 grand or their parents. How many people total in the fund? I think there's about 15. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. This is getting titillating. Uh, let me take a minute here. You know, I've been exhausted, right? I've been running on fumes, okay? And I drink this stuff, Magic Mind. It's this little company out of LA and out of Venice. And they're just little nootropic shots. Boost energy and focus, crush procrastination, and elevate mental clarity. So I just drink one of these before or in the middle of a podcast. And it's like half a cup of coffee, but it just like, it's like I'm taking, it's like I'm drinking Adderall but that's not bad for you. And it gives you, it's got all these vitamins and minerals. 
Um, it's it's good for you, and it just like locks me in. So hold on, let me taste it. Mm. Oh, that's yum yum. If you guys want to go check them out, they're called Magic Mind. I'll put a little link in the description. It's fire though, uh, and it's certainly better than these. Uh, you know, not methy pills that I've been taking. There's no methamphetamine in those. Okay, Ian. Mm. Life on the road is hard. So yeah, Magic Mind. Shout out. Thank you for sending these in. Um, you know, we had those in the fridge. They just came on board as a sponsor too. Ma- oh, really? Yeah, Magic those Mind? in the fridge, the oh, Magic Mind things. Yeah, dude. You, have, you, have you had them yet? Yeah, I like them. They're yeah. not bad. No, a little bit no. of a, like a, a tangy flavor, but you adjust to it. I, I like them. Yep. I'm happy they're on board. Yep, yeah. yep, absolutely. So, okay. So now you've got a bit of a problem, but not a criminal problem, just an embarrassment problem. You feel like you failed, which you have. You failed miserably. You bad. failed <laughs> zero out of seven. I mean, that's like <laughs> you're batting 0.00. Uh, when did you then, when did it elevate from just lying to them to? Well, so I continue to lie and everyone's asking for their payments and I, I'm working a full-time job at this point too. So I'm working for a, uh, a banquet hall down the road, uh-huh. um, a corporate center. And I'm like, giving up my paycheck. So I'm telling people we're waiting on the ticketing money and I'm sending fake spreadsheets showing like that they made money because they wanted to see detailed expenses and for the concerts. So the expenses were real, but the profits weren't right. And what the ticket sales did. Right. Um, Now that is a federal crime. Is it not? This was like the start. This wasn't to get more money. This was just like stalling, you know, this was like lying and stalling. What did you think was going to happen? I just wanted to buy more time until I came up with another idea to pay him back. <laughs> you hadn't thought beyond that. No, all I wanted to do, these are my friends and family. I'm not trying to scam right, them. Right, of course not. You just thought an idea will come to me. I That's just, what I hoped. Either that, something had to give. Wow. I, I needed some luck. I needed to keep thinking. And then one of my good friends at the time who was an investor, he pulls me up at the office one day and he's like, Ian, what's going on? You could tell me. That's when I told him everything about what happened. Hmm. That it genuinely wasn't my fault. That all the happened that first lie turned into a lot of lies Mm -hmm. and he wanted to help me Mm -hmm. so he was a this kid john roble he would end up being my co-defendant later on and he was always this hustler type of individual he went from selling pounds a pot to caddying to stealing golf clubs out of the to uh, the golf Mm -hmm. course to selling them to he would buy kids cracked iphones fix the iPhone thing where people thought there was no money in that iPhone left and sell it for hundreds. Wow. Guy was a hustler. Yeah. He had this business of selling Beats by Dre headphones and Otter boxes on Amazon. This is when Amazon's first getting big. Like you could be a seller and this and that back then. And he says, Ian, I can get these headphones Beats by Dre, which I didn't even know what they were. I was always an Apple guy. You can get them for 50 bucks and sell them for $400. I didn't know that there was a red flag of getting yeah, Beats yeah, by yeah. Dre for 50 bucks, but he brings it. It's wrapped. It's in the case. Everything looks, it looks cool. And we were getting the Beats pills, everything. It looks legit. So when I see that it's like a 400 or 500% rate of return, I'm like, holy, shit, this is a business. Mm. It's a viable business. What if I start, instead of getting investments and in all this, what if I ask people for loans and I can guarantee them a 50% rate of return on their loan? Because when you're dealing with product, you're not going to lose on the product. Like in my mind, I'm thinking it's not the concert business, so it's not an investment. This is a loan against our product. So I started to go to kitchen workers at the building I worked in mm. and stuff, and they would give me five or 10 grand. We'd buy, a, <laughs> I'd give my partner this five grand. Seriously, an 18 year old kid yeah. would go up to a blue collar worker and yeah. be like, I, I can get you 10% on your money. 50%. 50%. In well, 30 right. days. Right, right. I was saying, if you give me five grand, I'm giving you $7,500 back. Wow. In 30 days. Which is unbeatable and also a red flag. Insane. But, and it was a loan. So I right. just drafted a loan document mm-hmm. and got the money and I gave it to my partner, never asked where the electronics came from. And he would show up at the office with a knapsack full of ele- a Beats by Dre. Right. It was like Santa Claus. And this is before smash and grabs. <laughs> so we we really, you did, really didn't ask much questions, did you? No. So he shows up and he was the seller or whatever. And I was, I kept getting money and he, he would sell electronics and I was able to dwindle down my debt. 
with these other individuals. And I got it down to about 30K. Mm -hmm. And that's when one of my friends introduces me to this individual named Henry who had just gotten a settlement for like a million bucks. He sued a gym because he lost vision in his eye when a piece of equipment broke. So I go to Henry. This is 2013. I'm just about to turn, I just turned 18. And I'm like, hey, Henry, I lost this money on these concerts. Um, I'm starting this electronics business. Um, I need to get out of this debt I'm in and have money to buy product and this and that. And I told him I'm offering 50% rate to return. Well, he said, I'm already getting a 50% rate to return. I'm going to want more than that for the money. And now I'm desperate and I need the money. Mm. I end up walking away from that meeting with a $30,000 check, but a guarantee that I'd owe him 60 grand back within 45 days. Oh my God. Double his money on wow. that money. Wow. Okay. So, and uh, how are you selling these headphones? Your buddy, John, is the seller. He was, say, he's told me he was selling them on, on uh, eBay, right. Amazon, and, and stuff like that. So, and you were just the bank. If you wanted to make a big purchase of these $50 a pop Beats by Dre headphones, uh, I was in prison and I knew that that they didn't sell for that little. But so you, you would basically just, you were just funding him. Yeah. You just brought in the money. Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. So Ian, you know, if I'm sitting on a jury, let's say, let's say I'm a federal juror or a judge and I'm sitting here listening to this. I, I find it hard to believe some of it, quite honestly. I do. I, and I say that respectfully. I, I don't, okay. you know, uh, I, was I, on a jury. I adore you. I was on a jury too. You sat on a jury? I went to trial. No, oh, I thought you were said you did jury duty. I did do jury duty too. Okay, but I gotcha. was I went through a trial. So they they had right. the same questions. Right, right. <laughs> so it's just a little, you know, you're a sharp guy, right? Like I know kids are stupid, but you know, it's yeah. Uh you know, if you wanna redact some of what you just said, now is the time. No, you, it, there was you had no inkling that what was going on you know, with this guy, John might've been shady. No, I, I mean, shady maybe, but I never thought of that. I was, you got to realize all my attention was focused on how much pressure I was in. Mm -hmm. If you're an 18 year old kid and you have 10, 15 people calling you every day saying, where is my money? Mm -hmm. We want our money, you know, yeah. and kids when they're owed money, they get mad. Yeah. Especially when they think it's their entire life savings. Right. When you're talking about a couple grand. Right. That was my only focus. Yeah. So if someone came to me and said, hey, move this pound of pot, the only reason we talked about like I could have sold drugs was because I didn't have the connections to sell drugs. Mm. So I was willing to do whatever it took. Or you could have to made the connections, people. but I'm yeah. glad you didn't do that. But in that instance, that was my focus. There was mm. never time to think, is this legit before it was too late? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. And I, I hope cast no judgment because I did so much stupid shit. <laughs> and you look back on it and you're looking back from a prison cell is the worst yeah. because you have all of the time to just think, how could you like it was right in front of my nose. But anyways, OK, I accept that. Now you've just made a bad loan. You got a bad you got bad paperwork. No, no, no. I'll rephrase that. <laughs> Not bad paperwork. You've got a bad note. Bad paper is what they say, actually. So you owe a lot of money on 30 Gs you, you just borrowed. Uh, take us from there. So with that 30, I end up paying like the 25, 30K that I still owed. Had a little bit of mo more money for electronics, and we had already had some product. Mm. As soon as I paid back that money, word starts spreading out that Ian's super successful. Everyone got paid back on their investments. Everyone made money, and now he has this brand new electronics business. So what happens? Naturally, everyone starts calling me and wants to give me money. Right. Everyone's getting win, this and that. They hear about how now not only is it guaranteed their money back, now Ian's guaranteeing a profit. And yeah. I just have this pitch in my mind now. It's right. so easy to talk about, about right. you give me five grand, you get 50% on your money and we can offer that because we're getting the electronics for so cheap. It made sense. In my mind, it made sense. On paper, it made sense. You get a product, you're selling it for, yeah. you know, 10 times what it's worth. Right. There's enough money to go around for everyone. Right. Everyone right. gets a hold of it. And then I'm starting to get phone calls from parents that want to give me, you know, 25, 30 grand. Wow. Okay. Hold on. So 
did you take that money? I'm confused. Did you take the money that uh, the loan and pay back the fund from the concert business? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Assuming that the electronics business was going to make you the money back and some to pay back the guy. Who and gave that you would loan. be the end of it. Gotcha. I would just owe the 60. Gotcha. That would, and I was also still waiting on the foam from that foam show. Cause I didn't know they had me at that point. Oh, I see. So you I thought was, you had 20 grand coming I in. I thought from, I had more cause of the profit. I see. I, we told, they were told us. So I'm thinking, okay, there's that, there's that. I'll still work too. Mm -hmm. I'm working my job. I'm at a clean slate. I'm done. I was over, I was so, my passion right. turned into hate. I was so upset right. with the whole concert thing. Right. I had failed, but I was ready to put it behind me. Yeah. Now there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yep. Okay. Until everyone starts calling. <clears throat> Got it. So everybody now wants to spend money with you. Yes. Right? It was June, 2013. We took in over $500,000 in our bank account. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yes. In one day? No, over the course of a couple of weeks. Wow. Because How many investors is that? Half a million dollars? It wasn't that many. It was less than 20 because what happened wow. was as soon as the first one started coming in, I immediately paid back Henry as 60. And when he got paid back, right. my other friend that lost the money for us on the concerts said, Ian, I learned my lesson. You know, I, we're smarter now. Let's do another round of concerts. So I pitched Henry on like 15 concerts yeah. with Tyga, Chief mm -hmm. Keefe. Big names, Ace Hood, yeah. um, big, big names. And Henry gives me a quarter million dollars for concerts. Wow. So between Henry's quarter million and all these people dumping money into the electronics business. Yeah, close to a million dollars in, 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 in your, loans in and your war chest. Right. In my and war now chest. it's getting pretty convoluted. So all this money's going in. There's no accounting. It's going to a Wells Fargo bank account. Mm -hmm. I'm walking into Wells Fargo <laughs> in my little suit and tie. They're not batting an eye. Right. They're just letting me deposit all the money. Right. I could have done 9 million things. I could have gotten a credit line on that money. I could have bought some real estate, yeah. bought some tangible assets. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'm sending half of that money right off the bat for artist deposits for the fall. Yeah. And what I realized with my business was, so my plan was- So you went back to throwing concerts? Yeah. Because I figured I was a big believer and you have to fail to succeed. So I figured I already failed. Six times? essentially, but I, I lumped that into one, right? Sure. One failure. Yeah. Look at what rationalizing can do. Look what the so mind can I do. I rationalize that. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to college. Mm -hmm. This is my, I have another chance at life. I have this mm -hmm. money and I'm thinking, okay, I know the con the concerts on paper, this quarter million dollar investment I made into concerts would have paid out a million dollars if everything sold out and went perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I was going to make crazy money. I knew that if I'm borrowing money at high interest rates from these individuals, the concert business does not give you cash flow because you're planning for something six, seven months down the line. So the electronics business was supposed to be the cash flow to pay people back. Right. Well, that's when I learned the electronics were fake after I had already accepted the money. Amazon starts shutting down the accounts. Right. My business partner can move a couple thousand dollars worth of product. He can't move... $200,000 worth right. of product. Okay. So let me stop you there. Um, so your business partner was getting knockoff like Chinese Beats by Dre. I was told it was coming off of a truck. Like it was, it was whatever. The prices were so cheap because it was, um, they'd fall off the truck or whatever. That's, do you know, that's called stolen. Yeah. But that's, then that's what, that's what falling off a truck means. It means they got stolen. Later yeah. on, I realized <laughs> that you could go to Alibaba.com and those sites and buy pallets of knockoff electronics you, for five thousand oh, wow. dollars or whatever yeah, yeah. overseas, uh -huh. dude. You're getting like fifty or sixty grand worth of, but it's all fake because what I had friends that I'd get beats to when they yeah. made an investment, and they'd go to the Beats by Dre site and said this this barcode doesn't register. Wow, or it would rattle or right, something. It right. looks so real totally totally but it was they were all fake so then the people who buy it complain to amazon and you, they start and then, shutting down the accounts right. it's so strict right back right. then paypal accounts would get banned we'd have different phones that business never really took off that business was good for a couple grand the problem was i raised all this money yeah. on the basis of that right so now my cash flow end is gone mm -hmm. and i'm taking loans because now in my mind i'm like okay it's a loan so just like you could refinance a credit card with mm -hmm. another loan or whatever, mm -hmm. I could take one loan and pay off another loan. Mm -hmm. So this is where that Ponzi scheme aspect to of it comes, where I'm taking one loan to pay off That's another right. loan. That's right. But why are you still, but doesn't John know now your main investor? Uh, this Henry, loan, you mean? Henry, sorry, who's loaning you these big sums. He knows that 
the cash for the concerts is laid out. You know, he's not going to see that return. It's like a real estate deal. You're not going to see that return for maybe up to a year. Yeah. Why, why does he need to be paid off again? I thought everybody was whole. It's not him. His 250 was fine. It was the other few hundred thousand that we took in as loans that oh from him previously no that were that came on board once everyone got paid back everyone wants in on this 50 percent interest rate right so i'd have a parent call uh, and right. say hey here, ian here's 50k we want 75k back so, but why can't you just give it back to them if the business, you know, it would say, hey, it's no, we're no longer solvent. Well, so one, I never did that. You know, I, I got all this money. So, all right, even if I had the money, like if, when it all comes in, mm -hmm. you automatically owe 25K of imaginary money or whatever. Because if you're promising a 50% rate of return. Also. And you're held to that? Even if something goes wrong outside of your control, like found out my business partner was lying to me. I was lying. It was a guaranteed loan. You know, like I'm taking in this money and now we're, you know, we bought jet skis. We're going on trips. <laughs> we're thinking like we're these, these. That always looks great in front of the jury. <laughs> no, we're thinking. This honest kid, he's on a jet ski, his milk white it, it was concave just, chest we're just, we're gleaming just thinking, in the sun. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just like, all right, we got to get a payday too. Like we're thinking that's our salary. We buy company jet skis. We go yeah. on some trips. We yeah. go to dinners. It was like out of out of this money we raised, we probably misproportioned about a hundred k, you know. And then we did stupid investments, like I put ten grand into some stupid website. I put ten k into some shoe company, whatever, you know. I thought I was a hedge fund. I was mm -hmm. lazy, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, all right. So I get the idea. So now, now we are. That makes sense. So you are paying back these individual investors for these the supposed headphone business with loans from other people from from other people because right. people keep every week people yeah. are giving their money yeah and some people leave their money invested so if you started with 5k that turns to 7500 you roll the 7500 that turns to yeah. 12 5 Oof. and so on so some mm -hmm. people by the end of all this think they're owed 60 or 70k yeah off of a five grand investment now do you realize the deep water you're in when when that happens when the headphone business winds down and you're still taking on all of these investments, these loans? At the time, no, because I always had the bank being the concerts. So right. I figured no matter how deep I got in over these four months mm -hmm. from July to September, I was going to be okay because the concerts. They're going to hit, man. We're and this get these time I'm Marys. checking ticket sales, everything's selling right. well, it's doing well, mm -hmm. everything's going to be great. Mm -hmm. It's going to make a lot of money. And I could pay off all the, I could pay off the jet skis, any money I've spent as a part of our salary, yeah. I could pay back. Everything's good. Yeah. He, he, and then he we started, wipes the cocaine off his <laughs> nose and said, everything's going to be better than and ever. And then we started lowering the percentage rate. So 50% ended up going to like 20%, which is still a lot. Right. I would, I would tell people, Hey, like the electronic prices went up or right. this and that. So eventually it would go down to 20% over 90 days uh -huh. or 120 days. Right. But I was still in a deep water from that initial right. 50%. And you have no real accounting. There was none. Yeah. I didn't do a PL report until the FBI came and said, Hey, you're under investigation. Right. <clears throat> this I didn't sounds know like, accounting. This sounds like the connect with Johnny Mitchell. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we, we just take it in and we don't, yeah. you know, we'll worry about the rest later. Um, yeah. So, what concerts? So this sets the stage for the big climax. What concerts were scheduled? We what had this you were was, staking your future on. Yeah, this was um, September 2013. I'm mm -hmm. 18. We had three shows with Kid Ink, um, one show with Chief Keef, one show with Tyga, mm -hmm. um, one show with this DJ duo Kazette, mm -hmm. um, one show with um, Ace Hood, and. Um, we had a show with Am Schmacht, and then um, we had some other show. And uh, the first shows were in September with Kid Ink. Okay, so uh, across all shows, how much cash have you laid out for that? The, the Henry's full amount. All of Henry's money went into concerts so for deposits. So about a million bucks? Qu no, quarter million. Oh, okay. In, in d these concerts, right. and then you would owe, like, that was just for deposits. Right. We owed, like, another, like, 300 grand on top of that. Okay. So say all the shows cost, like, 550, 600. The okay. profit was going to be about 400. Right. So you, you plan on taking in a million over the course of, like, a month or over so? Over the course of September to December. The okay. shows were laid out. Gotcha. Um, the most expensive show was Tyga that cost a hundred grand. Okay. Um, the cheapest show was like Kid Ink, which was like 12 grand a pop mm -hmm. or, or 15 grand a pop okay. or whatever. And, um, 
So the first Kid Ink show happens. And that's at Waterbury. You were in Bridgeport the other night. This is worse than Bridgeport. This is Waterbury, Connecticut. Yeah. And these are sad towns, folks, if you don't know the the guy this in this area of Connecticut. The guy in charge of the show said we have five tickets sold. Five or ten t- tickets sold. Oh my god. And we knew we were gonna take a beating on the Waterbury one, but mm. we didn't know it was that bad. We got a cheap deal. We hedged our bets because he was cheaper if you book him for three shows. Why did you do it there though? It's a nightclub. I just figured it's a HUD area. He's gonna do well. It's Kid Ink. Hood. Yeah, I don't know who Kid so Ink is. He the thing with Kid Ink was he sells out all the European tours. He's great. He had a hit song with Chris Brown out. Everything was great, but he didn't translate into tour tickets. Wow. Which was interesting. Yeah. And so we had to go to the mall that day and pass out free tickets to get that place filled. Are you pretty demoralized? No, because at that point, it wasn't up until after the Tyga show mm-hmm. felt bad. Because when you're looking at it this way in the concert business, you lose 20 grand on one show. You got all these shows that are going to grow right. so much more money. Right. And they were selling great on paper. The, our second show in Boston with Kid Inc. and Rhode Island the next two nights we're already profitable and uh, making money. Okay, gotcha. So I'm like, okay, we took one beating, right, whatever. Fuck right, it, right. You know? And um, why the, didn't you consider going on the road, like actually throwing something in Atlanta or some places that are more affluent, but also, you know, urban? I was lazy, Johnny. I yeah. had this one guy that was a content promoter that said, hey, I'll do everything and yeah. y- you just give us a cut. Uh-huh. And what I realized now is someone always has to have skin in the game. Right. Now I don't do any business deal unless mm-hmm. the person has skin, not just equity they need to have money invested Mm -hmm. they need to be at risk of losing their money right to make sure that's the only way you're going to get them to actually do the work for you for me it's you gotta in the game dude. (laughs) yeah but that was the driving factor right and i just which i didn't promote i went from being this ingenious marketer right to so lazy this doesn't make any sense why are you lazy are, do you have a girlfriend now i did have a girlfriend at this time right so you got laid i got yeah i was getting laid i mean i wasn't an attractive kid back then no you know? no nothing's changed i was a but nerd listen, but i had the nice car i had a mustang convertible right I had the jet skis and i have this business that on the outskirts looks like it's super successful right right and so i'm hanging out with the biggest acts in the world <laughs> at 18 right so you get you go backstage i and got you, pictures with tyga i'm oh hanging out with God. kid ink we're popping in bottles right, we're doing all this right. we're and going you, to 500 hundred dinners dude and you're posting about it yeah. now you now girls are no hitting college you up my and, friends are at their freshman year of college and i'm chilling with tyga right who's an asshole by the way <laughs> i'm sure he is dude. that was when he was dating kylie too it's kylie jenner yeah this is 2013 um yeah, I would have just told you personally because i don't know who any of these bums are but they stink i would have told you throw a a classic hip hop concert. Those always sell because people my age and up will be going, we'll be listening to bone thugs. We'll be coming out to see, you know, you name that nineties rapper, right? Uh, until we're like 70 till we can no longer move. Johnny, all I had to do was just take the money and go to what I was good at. Maybe buy a club. Cause at this time I'd already, I took over the front part of tuxedo junction too. I sunk a hundred grand into this nightclub. Um, not the back part, but the front part. I called it Sky Bar and Lounge. I ended up getting sued by Sky Vodka because I had two Ys. Oh, God. Um, oh, and God. so I had to drop a Y, but that never made money. And mm-hmm. I got um, taken advantage of by contractors yeah. and everything. They would, uh, a $5,000 paint job turned into ten grand. all this. I think this is a perfect example of why you are successful now and will continue to be just skyrocket. Because I the failed moon. epically. Because you <laughs> failed epically, and it's just you keep going. You have no real doubt. Like, you had no doubt. That is a crazy thing. Like, I, that kind of mindset where you're like, oh, no, no worries. I'll just sink a hundred grand here, and ah, don't worry about taking a loss there. Well, like, you're just like, you're moving and reacting and doing less thinking. I'm resilient. And mm. I never had that. I was all, I'd get a shipment of 20 pounds of weed in and I'd be scared that I couldn't move it. Like it, it's, and you can't teach, like you're built that way. I'm built this way. Uh, and so I, I, I really wish I had some of that, but all, obviously like it was reckless too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. now you, now you put in thought with action. Now you're marrying the two. Calculated. But yeah. back then, no. So, but who could blame you? Okay. So. 
Uh, how many people ended up showing up to the first Kid Ink show in Oh, uh, we got like 500 kids, but they're all free tickets. All we free were at tickets. the mall passing them out. Right. I think I got a couple grand back on that show. Okay, but you lost 13,000. Yeah, I lost, okay. lost 13,000. Okay, grand. so bring us through. Second <laughs> night, it was like a sold out show at this venue in Rhode Island, like a six, 700 cap. Back then, and it's still probably like this now, but people would pay to get an opening slot on the show opening rappers oh. um, if they want to have their name on the right. flyer and get that under their belt. Right. So we had like 15 grand in opening rappers that <laughs> paid money, right? Well, the idiot in charge of collecting the money never collected the money. So we lost 15 grand right, right then and there. Right. What? Venue bounces a check on us too of ticket sales. Would take months to collect from right. them as well. Right. All this would happen. All these shows that actually were selling well and did well was a series of unfortunate events. That Boston show we did with Kid Ink never got that check to this day. It was a 20 grand investment, nothing, gone. And they can just run off with it and- By the time it takes to yeah, sue and this right. and that and go after assets. Chief Keef, I was grossing 50 or 60 grand revenue at, at Toad's Place in New Haven. Yeah. You know, he blew me off. Doesn't show up. What? An hour before the concert, the line is around the door. Oh. This is a mob scene. Chief Keefe's at his, a New Haven police are calling us saying, hey, you have to pay us the city for extra police because, you know, he's gang affiliated, this and that. We're like, no problem. We're making a load of money. We got him for 25K, paid him 12.5 up front, but tickets, it's sold out. Like, this is a, a slow... All he needs to do is perform, yeah. and we got our money. Right, We're good. Right. Hour before the manager calls us, and I'm heading to the venue, and my business partner tells mm -hmm. me, he's like, um, he woke up late. Don't worry. He'll be on the next flight. All you have to do is stall for an hour or two. So Where's like, he coming from? Um, Atlanta. Oh, Jesus. So it was like an hour and a half flight or right, whatever. Right, right. So no problem. He could get the next flight. Yeah. 45 minutes later, the manager calls and says, we can't find him. This is an hour before doors open. They said, we can't find him. He, there's only one more flight possible he could take, but he wouldn't get to the venue until like midnight. And at these shows, when the act doesn't show up in this type of genre on this, it could have been a riot. Totally. We had to tell the venue. They said, listen, we have to cancel. We're pulling the plug. Give everyone their money back. Venue wouldn't give me my money back too. They said, we'll give you a free show. <laughs> but they wouldn't give me the money back. And then we laid out money for the police, the mm. marketing, his upfront fee. So I was out like 20 out of pocket on that show. But then you take into account all the profits I would have made yeah. that was just lost right then yeah. and there. How much was that? We How probably would have made like 30 grand yeah. in profit right? on top of my layout. Yeah. right? He sends out a tweet the next morning, first time we hear from him saying, shout out to Connecticut, wasn't the promoter's fault, see y'all soon. Mm. Never heard from him ever again. Wow. Tried and to sue, you go through LLCs, yeah. this and that. Yeah. That was it. That's the problem with American business. And, you know, it's the good thing and the bad thing is like, you know, in Colombia, you just go, you know, kidnap them and wait for them to pay you. But it's like here, you, you know, you have to go through a legal system and lawyers got to get paid. It's like, it's so up. You but know? you know what I realized in that too, is that contracts don't mean what matters is the person signing it. And if they have the intent to honor it. But, but that's, you have to have contracts. That's what made America, America. That was the British way. That's yeah. what made us different from the Spanish and God forbid these other countries. But you could get out of a contract. I, but you, it, it, it. Uh, to me, like I, when I do business with people, Johnny, do me and you have, we do business. Do of we course. have a contract? No. There's a, it, it's, it's yeah. all about the intent, you but know? When there's, but when you're, when you're doing something that's defined like that, I like guess, yeah, you, you have to be able to enforce it somehow. That's why they have courts, but you're right. Sure. It's in practicality. It doesn't work because you're going to lose more money paying lawyers. Look at these big artists that are able to get out of contracts with their managers and stuff. Mm. I'm sure they have ironclad contracts and there's still something in there. Right. You right. know, there, there, there mm. are, I think there's a way out of everything if the person doesn't want to be in it. Right. You know, why would you want to be in business with someone that's not, yeah. you know, that doesn't want to be in business right. with you? Right. You can see why companies like Live Nation just own everything every venue now because you can't deal with an outside venue because i mean these guys are going to run off with your money and you can't do anything like you just want to buy that place yeah. like and then you control the elements to it 
You know what I mean? That's why I like having the studio because I'm in control. Right. I'm right. not depending on anyone else. Right. Right. It's just me, except for the video guy, but that's it. Yeah. And he could be fired, <laughs> you know? In wow. fact, he will be after this. Don't you know, hate I'm on Johnny Shane. Mitchell. I wave my finger. It gets done. <laughs> Shane, I will be Shane's done. Shane's been hustling for us, man, because everyone needs that one young kid yeah. that is like grows with the podcast. The young bull. Yeah. That's right. Rogan has it. Flagrant has yep, it. You yep. know? That's right. So, okay. And Take us through the rest of the fall. So now, now you're like over three. Now you're over three on concerts. Four. Over four. four. Yeah. Then, um, is there any way you can make your money back with just the last two shows? Hundred uh, percent. Okay. With, with the rest of them, Tiger was a hundred thousand dollar show that was going to gross. I think like two hundred fifty, three hundred k. Okay. So that's like two hundred grand profit. Okay. Almost sold out. Before that even happens, we get our first win. It's this Am Schmack show. Have you ever heard of Am Schmack? No. It was a big college tour. Venue sells out. We kill it. We the, the, I wasn't financially invested, but my partners were, and they had been on a losing streak. They made like 10 grand. Mm. It was awesome. Well, I'm, sh I'm schmacked is notorious for getting bad press, underage drinking, and getting venues shut down. Mm -hmm. The city shuts down that venue. Well, we had a show at the venue two weeks after on Halloween, the biggest party night of the year, besides Thanksgiving. We lose because the venue got shut down. No one else was available to host this act. 25 grand gone. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought, so So you, they, they got shot down before you guys, you told me it was a win. Yes, but I wasn't invested in that. Uh, that venue gets shut down and we had a concert that I was invested in happening two weeks oh, later. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Okay. Couldn't open for that night. Wow. We lose the 25 grand amount on the act and the booking and everything, plus potential profits that it was sold out. So say it, call it another 50 in the hole. And are you still taking money in? We're still taking You're money still from taking investments electronics, in? but now I have to, now that I own the club, yeah. I'm tight for cash because people are waiting on their money. There's right. delays. I'm just stalling a That's little bit. That's what I mean. Are people still uh, in uh, giving you loans? A little bit, but not now people are, instead of giving more money, they're just rolling over their investment, right. which is great for them, but doesn't help me because I need cash. And they're rolling over their investment, but they their investment is already- It's imaginary. Yeah, imaginary. Yeah. 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 So I start going to shady people. Gone. Okay. For cash flow. Okay. This is when I get into the drug dealers right. borrowing, you know, 150K at a time. Okay. Tell us about that. So I remember I own this nightclub at, at this point. It's called Sky Bar. And some of the promoters were in biker gangs, you could call it. And I asked one of them one night and I said, hey, I need money. I need cash. And he said, you know, there's going to be a high percentage on that. I said, that's fine. And this, the first time I ever borrowed money from a shady figure, he took me to his cousin. Hey, um the Spanish guy in Stanford. And we go to his house and um, I lay out, I say, hey, it's 50% on your money. And and this one, I went into it saying it's 90 days um, and I'll essentially clean your money for you. He goes to his bedroom, comes back with a pillowcase and dumps a giant stack of thousand dollars in 20s, mm -hmm. rubber banded meticulously on mm -hmm. the table. It's just big mound. Mm -hmm. um, the FBI would later get a photo of it because I took a photo of it on my phone. Why? <laughs> um, I just documented everything. It was so cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> like in my eyes back then. And he says, you know what happens if you don't pay back this money? This is like a scene out of a movie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'm just assuming I'm going to get killed because I'm dealing with shady individuals. And I took the money yeah. and I used that to pay off acts. Like I paid... Yeah. Whatever, I help with cash flow and I just find shady figures and I would just borrow from one shady figure to pay off another shady figure or pay off another lender. Oh my God, this is dangerous now. It's extremely dangerous. Wow. So did well, did guys like that ask you what the investment was? Did they? Um, so they knew that I was in the concert business yeah. and I, at this point, I, I'm not really, in, they know I'm not really investing. I think they just saw me as bleeding for money. They knew I was a good kid. And they just, they wanted to make money. It was a win for them because they wanted to flip it and they all wanted checks back. Okay, great. So here, and this brings us to money laundering. Now, were they satisfied with losing? But it, it, like if if, the, if you, they gave you 150 in cash yeah. and you brought them back a check for a hundred, it's a clean check. It's legitimate now, but would they still want to be paid back in full or would they accept a loss if it was cleaned money. See, at the time, I never really knew what money laundering was or any of this. I didn't watch any of those shows growing up. So I didn't realize that I was really doing them a favor. So I gave them everything back or at wow. least promised them everything. Oh, you didn't have to when do I that, should have been buddy. undercutting. Of yeah. course. There of course. could have been ways. I didn't even need to promise them interest. All I need to do is just give them their money minus some. I could have made money. 
but I never looked at it that way. Right. Oh, wow. Isn't that funny? I had no they were criminal taking intent. Ad- they were taking advantage of you. <laughs> yeah. They were getting a double whammy. You are walking through life like a fish out of water. Yeah. It's like, it's so bizarre. It really is. Uh, it's a television show. It's a movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the only thing missing is your yarmulke to make it even more bizarre. I was just, I was naive, man. Yeah. I, I just didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know any better. But you knew that money was illegal though. I knew they were in shady shit. I didn't ask. I didn't want to know anything. What did you think the shady was? I knew it was drugs. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't like know the specifics. I didn't know their business. I didn't want to deal with any of that. Were you stressed out now knowing that you were now borrowing cash from Dude, every gangsters? day. Because I'm not only getting now harassed by the gangsters for mm. money, I'm getting harassed by all the people I owe money to right. that's piling up. And I have a pressure that these concerts need to work out. Okay. So how much did you borrow in street money? Probably like 300K. And then with interest, like 500 yeah. is what it was promised. And you got 90 days on it. Essentially. It was in and out. It wasn't all at one time. Right. You know, it would take from one to pay off another. Yeah. It was like a Ponzi scheme in itself just with the cash aspect. Wow. Wow. So you have yeah. like two different elements going on basically. Yeah. So now you're just, are you just praying that this final Tyga show there, is a hit? There was Tyga and a couple others. Okay. okay. On that 100 grand investment. I got a wire transfer for, I think, $8,000. Wow. Yep. I was banking on walking away with two hundred grand that night. I got $8,000 back. What happened? So because of that show that got the other van- venue banned, um, the dean of the campus said they didn't want bus tickets to be buses from other schools to come onto their college campus. Okay, so this the venue for Tyga is on a college campus. Yes, it's the Got Ryan it. Center, and it's the college campus's arena. What's the college? Uh, University of Rhode Island, biggest party school. Got it. One of the biggest party schools in America. Oh, it's a perfect venue. Perfect venue, 5,000 capacity. I think we had like 4,000 tickets sold or whatever. Oh. But a lot of those tickets are through bus sales because you need to get the kids from all the towns, Providence, Kingston, all these different mm-hmm. areas. Because not just you or I would support that. So this show was marketed. It was planned for months. It was their first official concert of the year. Tyga's hot. It was a recipe for success. And we got them for a good price too. We paid them 40, which mm. was good for that arena and stuff. It was a mm. no-brainer to do. Yeah. And Tyga was even, I would say, on the same level as Big Sean, but we had months to market. Right. We marketed the out of this. And um, buses, trips, a couple days before the show got canceled. And the thing with bus tickets is no one pays until the actual event. Like they hand cash, get on the bus. Right. That comes part of it. So we lost like, I think like 2000 ticket sales. Oh my God. Overnight on bus tickets. So what so, do you do? What did you try to do? To... I couldn't do anything. Yeah. I just, I was at that point. Did Tyga show up? He showed up. He was an he... asshole. Well, yeah. But was he yeah. like, what the? Fuck? No, I mean. It Where's looked, everybody? Those things that we still had, I think like the final ticket count was like 1700. Yeah. Which when you pipe and drape that arena, yeah. it looks good. Right. When you're on the stage with the smoke, it, it was a great show. Right. He was a great performance. Right. I'd say Big Sean was great live. He uh. was great live. Those things are awesome. So the, you got had a good time in the moment. Oh, Sounds like the concerts were great. <laughs> Popping Ace of Spades bottles with right, Tiger in the right, green right. room and yeah. that experience and it's but it's a hobby. Let's face it, it's a losing hobby. Dude, There's, I was I was I was bad. I remember I was with my ex, my girlfriend at that point. She came to the show and I'm just like I don't know what the f- I'm gonna do. Wow, because everything was riding on that. And I had a couple more shows after, but when you lose 200k, that's a 200k swing. Right. The other. 20 or 30 doesn't matter. So now the glean in Ian's eye is finally starting to dim. Yeah, this was November 2013. By December, the whole thing was bust. Wow. No one was giving me money. Yeah. I was owed. I owed the street dealers. I owed normal investors. And I owed now Henry his return because it's the end of the run. He hasn't seen a penny yet. Okay. What's the total on that? With interest, I owed about $1.3, $1.4 million. Right. Total. Total. Did you tell anybody this was your ex-girlfriend the only person you confided she didn't even to? know what the situation was my she, business partner didn't even really know john because wow. he was at college he was kind of out of it at right. that point um she they knew i was stressing yeah i'm holding this all in i mean they knew i was like at that point like i was getting beat up a little bit like the shady figures got me one day brought me to the basement of the club took the end of a screwdriver the handle started whacking my fingers in the icy cold. It was cold out. 
hold up my shirt, hands on my desk, and they're just whacking each finger, saying, we want our money. Wow. They came to your club. Came to my club. Sky. Yep. Sky. Mm. Brought me in the basement. Started whacking the fingers. This is out of a movie. It's yeah, Exactly. They bring, uh, they lead you, they have a couple of goons there and they just grab so, you by the neck or they, so, or do you just go like you're being executed? So what happened was in order to stall, I gave them the key of the club because I was like, listen, if it doesn't work out, you could have like the equipment, whatever. Yeah. I'm just trying for whatever. You right, know, I remember right. signing like documents saying like you could have the club and I didn't even own the club. I just owned the business. I didn't right. own the building. You didn't own the real estate. Yeah. yeah. I was coming up with fake real estate documents. Yeah. I was selling you know, what is it called? Water as if it was gold to these drug dealers because they didn't know any better. Mm-hmm. And I'm just trying to stall. It was never to f- anyone over. I'm just stalling and I'm mm-hmm. lying like crazy. And <laughs> I was famous for keeping my phone on airplane mode or do not disturb yeah. and blocking people. Yeah. And so I wasn't answering my phone with them. And so they came to the club and me and my business partner are there one day, John, and he pulls a gun out first. This is how it started. And he, and he says it to John. He points at him because John would always say something slick. Points a gun at John and says, don't say a thing because john would always say something like slick back or whatever his friend that he's with leaves him upstairs and then uh with john and then the other friend and me he's like this guy he's like go downstairs Mm -hmm. and i go downstairs and that's when he puts me on the table he's like stick out your hand there's a staple gun next to me i'm thinking that they're gonna staple gun my hands no he's going through the desk finds a screwdriver and just starts whacking each finger until I agree that I'm gonna keep answering my phone. Are you yelping in pain? Or are you taking it I, I'm, like a I, man? Yeah, I'm a little bit of both. I'm like, dude, you don't have to do this. Like, I'm trying to talk. That's what I was. I was a talker. I was yeah, trying to talk yeah, my way out of it. Yeah. Say whatever I need to say to get yeah, out of it. Yeah, dude, I got a ship in headphones, man. At that point, the electronics was done. It was like, <laughs> dude, you know, I'm just waiting. I'm just trying to stall, man. I do not want. I want to give these people their right. money. I have no bad intentions. Right, I'm right. not trying to do anything. I'm living with my parents. At that point, I actually had a little like apartment above the club um, that I was renting, but it wasn't, you know, and the worst part was it was around the holidays. So everyone wants their money. Of course. When you're pressed around the holidays because everyone's trying to get gifts and this Did people show up at your parents' house? One parent investor showed up when I wasn't answering calls and they just came to talk to say, hey, you know, what's up? Yeah. That was it. Yeah. and did that raise alarm with your dad or your parents? They were luckily not home that day because wow. that was a busy season for my dad. My yeah. mom wasn't around. Um, so I got lucky. Mm. But other than that, you know, I got really lucky with Shady Figures never going there. Everything, my whole life's been a series of luck. Yeah. You yeah. know? Well, luck one way or the other. Yeah. Bad luck, good luck. Mm. What, uh, so now it's the end of the year, you're bust. Uh, what happens? So... My first step was, this is when I finally, I meet with a lawyer and, um, who was promised, he was a friend of my dad's and he promised me that he would represent me for free million dollars. The legal fees covered this and that. And he was there to help me. Hold on. So you can, you you confessed. Who did you tell? I told my lawyer, he's the very first person. It was me, my business partner went and my dad came. My dad's hearing all this unfold for the first time. I give him all the names of everyone. I tell him what's happening, everything, this and that. So he comes up with a plan. He's like, okay, you owe this. First off, you're not paying anyone the interest. You're gonna, we're gonna calculate what their out of pocket loss is. So say they think they're owed 20 grand with interest, but they only put in two grand and they've gotten like three grand interest payments. Technically, they owe me a grand. Not right. that we would ask them. Right, right. So he sends out letters to everyone saying, hey, we're reviewing, you know, our company's books, this and that. Um, we'll be in touch soon. Everyone stops calling me now. Well, they first they're blowing up my phone and the, after they got that letter, but my lawyer says, don't talk to anyone. We got this covered. Mm-hmm. He then does a review with his legal team. They calculate all the money that each person's owed or not owed, mm. sends a letter. So some kids who thought they were owed all this money are now getting letters saying they're owed nothing. That pissed them all off. Right. They go to the police, the local police. Okay. Henry goes first because we give him a letter saying, hey, Henry, you made an investment. You did not make a loan. All of these concerts lost money. So you're getting pennies on the dollar. Yeah. And we would come up with a payment plan. Well, Henry had a drug issue and he was high one day and he went to the police. And when you're a local small city cop that has someone sitting in front of him saying he's owed half a million dollars or a quarter million dollars with the receipts for that, he's thinking this is the next... (laughs) 
huge scandal and there's millions at stake. That's right. And then I had all this press right. that I was this whiz kid. They named me the top 10 entrepreneurs in Connecticut, all this. And I owned a nightclub. So I have a target on my back already. Uh -huh. This detective's like the guy from the Wolf of Wall Street detective. Yeah. Automatically fixated. Yeah. But he's like a Boy Scout. Calls my attorney. Yeah. My attorney is like these personal injury attorney guys. Doesn't really do criminal law, but he's like revered in, mm -hmm. in, in the town. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he's a bulldog. And he said, listen, you guys got no case, this and that. Good luck. You know, teases him a little yeah. bit. Around this time, simultaneously, I'm not talking to investors anymore, you know, like the lawyers handling it. Mm -hmm. He said, listen, this is never going to get to court. Nothing. Um, he just said they're investigating. We'll set up a meeting with the police department to see what they got. So at least that was off my back temporarily. Mm -hmm. But now I have the drug dealers I have to worry about. Right. He wasn't getting, I can't send the drug dealers a letter right. saying, hey, you're not owed any money. So at this point also, I have a gambling problem. Uh, yes. And which is funny, I was editing that episode for that bookie. I used to go to Yonkers Raceway. That was my spot. Okay. Is because that right? it was 18 and older to get in. Connecticut casinos are 21 and up. I was 18. So I'd go and play electronic baccarat and I'd win good money. Wow. <laughs> at that casino. Yeah. That and was they, your game? You didn't put money down on horses nothing. or anything like that? It was always that. Wow. And I would play baccarat and the Asians would call me young boy. <laughs> they would say, young boy, the best. <laughs> and I would turn 520 grand sometimes playing baccarat. 520 grand? $500 into $20,000. Oh, gotcha. I think I my mean, winnings wow. overall, I probably made like three or 400 grand there. Wow. And I would depend on that to pay off some of these shady figures. Sometimes wow. I would go with cash and I'd yeah. go and run back to Danbury and pay people right. off. Right. So you could take 20K out in cash out of your winnings and, yeah. and go to and, and go and a pay drug people dealer. off. And that's wow. how I would eventually pay off like some of the biggest acts in the world. I owed the chain smokers 25 grand at one point for like four months. And I paid them off with casino winnings. Um so This I, is Yeah, it's crazy. There's like six how old different are you stories. Now? I'm 18 still. Yeah, the FBI started investigating when I was 19, or still 18, actually. How did you shake the gambling addiction, or did that just kind of fizzle out? That fizzled out over time. I always didn't look at it as an addiction. I looked at it as something like I could turn off and on, and I looked at it as a means yeah. to an end. Like, I needed to do that, you yeah. know, because that was what the only thing. I, I was always, you do what works. Yeah. So I found that that worked for me, yeah. and it would also later be my downfall because I'd get my bond revoked because of it. Okay, we'll but, wait for that. I yeah. want to talk about that. But what ends up happening is, is that I do this, like I, I borrow money from someone else in Danbury when they're really after me, borrow money, go figure, me and my friend figure that we're going to go to California to ask my aunt and uncle, who are very wealthy, he's a cardiologist, their son writes for the office, all of this, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. My plan is go to California with the 15 grand that I owed them and then ask them for 500 grand to pay off everyone. Well, on my way to go on this- and Are you close with this aunt and uncle? Yeah, very close. They were like my initial investors, this and that. Uh, and me and my business partner make a last hurrah trip. This is the end of the year, 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, our lives are at stake here. Mm -hmm. We're thinking we have to pull this off. On the way after we get 20 grand from this guy that we knew, an ex-mafia guy who gives us the cash- and on the way, we stop. We're trying to catch a red eye flight to um, to to California, mm -hmm. to LA. We're like, well, we don't have any spending money, so we need to go try and make some. So we stop at the casino at Empire on the way to uh, JFK, and I lose all of the money to like two hundred bucks or three hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And they were running a scratch off thing that night where you got a scratch off ticket when you came in for their holiday special. This is like right after Christmas, right before New Year's, and my business partner's drunk, yelling at me on the floor, "You're." A idiot we're f dead now and he goes and wanders off i play the scratch off and win five grand on the scratch off cash it in turn our money back to like 17 so we were at a loss anyways but we're like let's get out of here it's 6 a.m we get a red eye go to california pay my aunt and uncle back um we gave him a little bit less we said here's 12 we'll give you the other money eventually right. or whatever so you have some spending money so we have spending money so that you were going to pay them off from all those back investments and then say hey would mm -hmm. you like to loan us a, a, another paltry investment of <laughs> half a million dollars? Yeah. So you were going to def essentially defraud your favorite aunt and uncle. That was at the intent. We were asking for a loan. No guarantees, nothing. We were going to, our plan was to come clean about everything and say, listen, there's dangerous people after oh, us. Gotcha. Okay. We need the money. This was more of a gift. I see. You know, right. To save our lives. Right. And we were too chicken to ask them until like the last day of the trip. 
So that whole trip, we're driving around with a private driver we couldn't afford. Um, we were going to strip clubs. Mm. We end up a porn star <laughs> that week oh, yes. that we paid her 200 bucks each for Brittany Olson, not Brie Olson, but her name's Brittany Olson. She's I feel on like Pornhub. I've seen her work. Yeah, she's got the angels on the back. And oh, yeah, how much did you pay her? Two hundred bucks each. Our driver That's was it. Al- our driver was oh. an Albanian, <laughs> and brought us to the strip club. He's like, "You guys want to f- a porn star tonight?" <laughs> and uh, we're like, "Yeah." <laughs> so we bring her in this SUV to. We're staying at a beach house in Malibu <laughs> that my aunt and uncle owned, and we're there by ourselves in the outhouse there. And we, <sighs> she's like, "I don't do foursomes." And I'm showering in between. So she f- me first. In an outhouse? It, no, it's a nice guest house. I'm, oh, I was on the thinking beach. you said outhouse. I was picturing you <laughs> her in a no, honey bucket. I, sorry, I meant like Used the, by the some beach construction house. Workers. Yeah, uh, the okay. side house. It's right. three doors down from Adam Sandler's house. Okay. And a few doors down from Miley Cyrus's house. And then I leave the room. She takes a shower and then f- my business partner. And then the driver's waiting outside and brings her back. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our last hurrah ever. My last uh, vacation. How'd of you my hit life. it? Did you put in some work? It lasted about 10 seconds. Nice. There we go. <laughs> the easiest 200 bucks you ever made. Yeah. But I got to say that uh, I cheated on my girlfriend with a porn star. Wow. Did yeah. she, did she find out? Did you I told her later on, she saw it on like a video or a tweet or something. All right. You guys were already, she, split up, were already right? split up. We're already split. She had wrote in her diary that, um, two things. And it's pretty funny. She wrote in her diary that, I was getting attacked like by dangerous people and that me and her had a threesome with my best friend. The mom reads the diary and says, you have to break up with that oh kid. Oh my God. Yeah. Who the f- keeps a diary? Who are you? Anne yeah, Frank? She's 18. Jesus. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that happened. Okay. That's awesome. I'm yeah. really glad you brought that up. That was the last hurrah. That's like, I don't really get to tell that story. It never goes yeah, down that route. Yeah. Yeah. But you knew with your old pal, Johnny Mitchell, Johnny, you knew, I'm giving you the exclusive, but you man. know, you know, Johnny boy, yeah, so, I might be old, but I was young once and I know a thing or two about, you know, so, um, outhouses and hookers. Go ahead. We, um, we end up asking them on the last day we come clean and they said, yeah, we'll help you. We'll give you 10 grand after tax season. <laughs> hey, that's why they're rich. <laughs> they don't they don't make stupid investments. So we flew back the next day, screwed our driver out of the money, said we'll PayPal him, and we never PayPal them because we owed him like three grand. We didn't have it. We spent all the money. Yeah. And we went as soon as we got off that plane, we went right to the main drug dealer's house that we owed all this money to and begged for our lives to work out <laughs> an arrangement. Wow. And um my dad ended up meeting him and he ended up falling like in love with my dad, respecting my dad. Your dad met a drug dealer? Yeah. I got my dad. My dad saved my life. Who's he, the drug dealer? You don't have to say his name, obviously, but it's well, just this guy from Stanford. He's a Spanish guy? Spanish guy. So he he's ended selling up, cocaine, heroin. So he actually ended up getting arrested and deported. Uh-huh. But after all this, before all this happened, he formed a relationship with my dad, got into a business and a restaurant with my dad. Wow. Um, and you know, it just got worked out. Yeah. We'll put it that way. Right. With all the shady figures, right, right. my dad saved me in that. He right. smoothed it over. They realized that I wasn't there to f- them. Mm. See, in this business, people react strongly if they know you're intentionally trying to f- them. Yeah, disrespect. They also, so I never intentionally tried to disrespect mm. them. They also knew the other thing that saved me is that word was getting out that the FBI was involved. Right. And so they didn't want to touch you. They can't harm you now if they know the feds could be watching. They can't harm me. And they also are worried what I was going to say if I would leverage my relationships to do of that. Of course. Of course. My business partner tried to. I had their back because the feds found out names that only me or my business partner would know. So they're going to these in- shady individuals and they're saying, no, I don't, I don't know. I've never met this kid in my mm-hmm. life. And I'm backing up that claim. I never mm. ratted on them. Mm-hmm. So that saved me with them too. It built street cred. Right, right. That Because they're looking at it, the kid didn't snitch. Right. You know, I didn't turn them in. I didn't try to save myself. Yeah. I could have very easily said, hey, I'll hand you on a platter. Right. The biggest drug dealers in Danbury that are selling serious weight. That's what most people would have done yeah. is in, in danger, even though they knew what they got into, they would just go to the, the feds. And that saved my life. Yeah. And you could have got out of everything because you could have been like, hey, I know I pulled a little bit of investor fraud, but I'll give you guys that are moving 
hundred kilo kilos of heroin, you know, and you could, yeah. you know, or wear a wire, or yeah, anything. yeah, you yeah. know, I could have done that, and, and right. I know some were involved with guns, yeah, like I could have bought guns, right, right, and stuff, but I knew, right. and my dad didn't raise me to do that, you know, yeah. So it was a mix of the love that and respect that they had for my dad, mm -hmm. and then realizing that I wasn't like a bitch in a way. Yeah, your dad's a <laughs> G. Your yeah, dad is really a G. Is. Yeah. Okay, so that's how you managed to get out of or straighten out the street debt. That got me out of the crosshairs of the debt. So now my life is back in a safe spot. I don't quite spot. understand that, but okay. I mean, I get it and I don't get it. Johnny, I don't quite understand it even to this day. Right. All I know is, is that a lot of moving parts happen. Yeah, yeah. And that like, if I'm ever make it like really big yeah. and we cross paths, I'll take care of them. Right, right. You know, yeah. it's one of those things. Yeah. I think it's a mutually understanding. Fair, fair. But I'm not out there to them out of the money yeah. and it's not yeah. like something where it's like here you owe us some money right. right now right so okay so now you have the problem of the fbi investigating the uh the fraud from your your family friends money so at right? first it's local police we go to the meeting this is before they have the bank records this is 2014 now mm -hmm. they think that it's just all the money got spent in real estate. They think I'm a drug dealer. They think money got spent on Universal Studios. They don't know because they don't have anything yet. So we're, we blow it off, nothing. And I got the idea to reopen Tuxedo Junction. Mm. This is my my next hurrah. Nice. You got another brilliant plan. I got another oh, brilliant boy. plan. I'm thinking, go back to my roots. I have no money. Just my dad's paying for the paint, the supplies. I work out a deal with the landlord to clean it up because the building's sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to redo this whole building. Like, get it up and running by myself. I have a couple of friends and I opened up Tuxedo Junction and I leveraged all those connections that I had in the in the industry to get big acts, find some new investors, and I start booking the biggest acts in the world. The Chain Smokers, Steve Aoki, Adventure Club, um, big, big names, Yellow Claw. Oh my God. So this is happening while I'm being investigated and on trial by the FBI. And haven't paid off any of no. the debt. I get about another 250 grand for people that made legitimate investments into the club. So Tuxedo Junction, the club, had nothing to do with the FBI right, case. I see. Okay. This was formed after they were investigating. How did you get these people to trust you? They what didn't was it know your there reputation? was an investigation. No one but knew. But didn't you have a reputation now from not for not paying money back in a fund? In a small area, yeah, right. but there was no news articles yet because right. there was no arrest, gotcha. nothing. So I met new people yeah. through different avenues, mm -hmm. you know, and... People, there was press on me that I was reopening Tuxedo Junction, so that attracted people to me, mm -hmm. and I got it up and running. Wow! By myself, that is incredible. Yeah. And then, and so, tell us about these concerts. Were they actually successful? Well, so before that, this opens in June 2014. Mm -hmm. I go and get a subpoena to the Department of Banking in May of 2014, and I'm thinking, okay, great. That the local investigation's not going anywhere. I can go to the feds because they're higher up. Mm. Clear the whole thing up. I go in without a lawyer and I testify for like six hours. I give them every bank record, every information, all my my phone records, mm. everything just handed to them on a silver mm. platter just to clear it up and say, hey, this wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. People are owed money. Let's make a deal. Right. And I left the shady figures off the list, of course. Yeah. But it, all everyone else, names, addresses, everything. Mm -hmm. At the end of the meeting, they said, there's two gentlemen here waiting to speak to you. Can you talk to them? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. I just talked to you guys for six hours. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to cooperate. Mm -hmm. They put me in a room and it's two guys with these old suits on and they whip out their badges and it says postal inspectors. I'm like, what the f is a postal inspector? And you can see they have guns on yeah. and stuff, mm -hmm. but they have the badge. And I don't know what a postal inspector is. They begin to interrogate me for the next hour and a half, two hours. And I tell them everything. And they asked specific questions, though. See, they knew everything going into it. They were listening on my interrogation. Mm. So they're asking targeted questions about jet skis, concert investments, mm -hmm. this and that, because they're trying to get you to lie. At the end of the meeting, they say, they hand me a target letter, a formal piece of paper that says, you are officially under investigation by the FBI. Oh, wow. So they do that. They do that. That's very real. Wow. So all these individuals that you see get arrested by the FBI, they know. They know it's it, coming. The FBI doesn't arrest, unless you're like a terrorist or something. Right. Or like a drug dealer. Yeah, but even the drug dealers kind of know if yeah. they're being looked at, right, you know, because right. they're talking, they do not make a move until they have a concrete case. Right, of course. So they give me the target letter. That's when I knew, I was like, never told me I needed a lawyer, nothing. None of that. Wow. I immediately, when I left that conversation, I go and search good 
federal criminal attorneys. Yeah. Got a lawyer, told him everything. That's when the lawyer gets involved. Right. Told my mom everything. She paid the retainer for the lawyer because my dad already knew what was going on. How much on. was that? It was only 7500 for an initial consultation. Right. Okay. The feds would later pay for everything because I had no assets. And in federal court, you could get your private attorney appointed to you. Right. To pay for you through CGA oh, wow. or whatever it's That's called. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so he became my lawyer, got us a meeting with the federal government, the U.S. attorney, where it was a reverse proffer, where I got to sit down with them and they told us everything we had and they put together their case. They said everything. They were calling me Bernie Madoff and I had no idea who Bernie Madoff was. <laughs> and they were, you could tell, like it was this whole big room of FBI agents, interns at the FBI, interns at the Justice Department, two head U.S. attorneys for Connecticut, this giant room all after me. The IRS has a criminal di investigation wow. di uh, division. It was this big room and it's just me and my dad and my lawyer facing down 30 individuals. Think about the resources that the federal so government much. put behind, to, to take down one man, barely man, 19-year-old yeah. boy. Johnny, it was crazy. Wow. And that's when I knew like this was serious. This was big leagues, but they didn't even offer me a good deal. I think it was like three years, which is about what I got after going to trial. So while they continue to investigate, yeah. I'm running this nightclub. Mm -hmm. I'm running the biggest nightclub in Connecticut for electronic dance music. Right, right. And it's in their face. Like, I'm getting arrested for local shit now, like yeah. liquor violation, state cases, petty stuff, because they're just after me. Oh, wow. So but, the feds are sicking the local people yes, on your the city officials, operation. the fire marshals coming every night. Wow. They're looking for drugs. They're raiding everything. Wow. But no one knows in Danbury there's an FBI investigation going on until I would later get indicted behind closed doors, like what happened was they made a deal with my lawyer saying I would just turn myself in. Well, the feds lied and they raided my house at five oh in the morning God. with the guns and the M16s Holy and the IRS. Your parents' house? Yeah, my parents' house. They came fully loaded. While up they and were down. asleep? Yeah. Knocked on the door. They're oh. yelling, where is he? Hold the dog back. This and that. Got me while I was in my boxers. Made me put on cowboy boots because I had no laces on. They were my cowboy boots from the school play. Oh my God. Raided the house. It was nuts and took me out and I gave them my phone password, which was the biggest mistake I ever made. Why? Because they asked me for it. I just Wouldn't they have to get go. a warrant? Couldn't they have got a warrant for it? I was reading something that it's hard for them to get into iPhones even with a warrant. Oh, interesting. Because Apple yeah. doesn't want to give it up. Yeah, I was reading that yeah. even with a warrant. Yeah. But all, I put together their whole case. Always make them get a warrant. Yeah. Even if you know they're going to get it. I, an OG, when I was down, I told him, man, I just let them search the house. He goes... Make them get a warrant. Make them do the work. So while I'm facing off against the feds, I'm running this nightclub. And now is that profitable, this operation in the so nightclub? It was, uh, uh, it's a high revenue business. Like the first year we did 250K revenue. Second year was on track for 500. I was only in business like a couple of years. But um, it, it it's a brand new business. So it's not making money. So it brought on more debt, but it has some revenue. But the problem was any money I made went to past debt, which so I never got ahead. So when I should have right. been paying the electric bill or the rent, I'm paying off some investor from two years ago. But that's good though. Like that reduces mm. your, doesn't that reduce your criminal liability? No, because then it looks like witness tampering and this and that. Oh. And it, it, I needed to reinvest that money to make more money and mm -hmm. I never did that. Right. And so it was mixing good money with bad money. Mm -hmm. So I had to keep borrowing. It was just a domino effect of a cluster. Oh, no. So then I start having, I racked up a $30,000 bill with the electric company. I took wood from the club and put it in front of the meter so they couldn't find it for six months. The night of a show, it was the act Carnage. I don't know if you know him, DJ Carnage. Uh -uh. Huge show. Two hours before I'm on a criminal trial, I'm, I start my jury trial, right? I get a call from my friend that's setting everything up at the club. Eversource just removed all the wood with the city and they disconnected the power. <sighs> oh! I'm just getting out of criminal court after my first day of trial, the day after jury selection, and I'm calling every electrician in town to go and set up this generator for me. And I had no money. There was no operating money. On days of the show, we would go to the dollar store to get... With ticket money, we would get sodas, water, so we could resell them at a higher rate. Right, right. Everything was down to the last dollar. Yeah. Oh, so shit. I gave a check that I knew was going to bounce to the to the company to get a three thousand dollar generator. Then paid off the electrician to install it, just to get this up and run. It was crazy, wow. crazy things like that. So would did happen. did the concert go ahead? It did. So they they didn't cut the power off then. They did cut the power. I used a generator. Or the generator, yeah. of course. It was always just 
hit or miss. Yeah. Yeah. And it was luck, a lot of luck right. mixed with perseverance. I never gave up. Right. Always kept pushing. So uh, you now you're already in trial. Why did you choose to take it to trial and not take the offer? We were happy to plead guilty mm-hmm. because we knew people owed money and mistakes were made to no jail time. But the feds were so fixated wow. that I needed to go to jail. An 18 year old kid, they needed, they wanted jail time and they didn't just want probation or a year. They wanted serious jail time. And that's why we went to trial. Yeah. We believed that there was no criminal intent in this. Right. So you didn't come back with like lesser prison time, like a year and a day. They wouldn't play ball. Nothing. Nothing. Just like this is our offer. Yeah. It was a bull offer. That's what they do. What was the, what were you facing? Um, according to the news, I was facing 120 years. So like when you read these Fed <laughs> cases, they add up, you know, right. wire fraud is 20 years each and money laundering is right. 10. And then right. the, I, they charge me making a false statement, uh, for that first count. And I got indicted on 15 counts. Right. And then they just go like to the maximum of each count and yeah. they just do the math. Yeah. Right. Really right. after trial, what I was facing after losing, I won about half the counts at trial. Um, how long was the trial? A month almost. Wow. And it was actually... What's interesting is, so the day of jury deliberations, the feds always want you to get convicted the first day. Like Sam Bankman freed, got convicted after a few hours. They think that's a win. Yeah. It took the jury almost four days of deliberations. They came back after day one and said, we can't reach a verdict. But in federal court, the judge has to order them to go back and reconsider under federal law. Um, So they kept coming back saying, we can't reach a verdict. And then they asked the question... What happens if this goes past Thanksgiving? Because this is November, the day before Thanksgiving. Judge says, we'll have to reschedule till December, this and that. They go back 10 minutes later, they have a yeah, verdict. They want to go home. They want to go home. And it was a mixed verdict. Some were, so on wire fraud, some were guilty, some were not guilty. Yeah. All the Henry counts were a mistrial. Okay. But in the feds, they lump everything together. Dude, they are, it's so dirty. That's they why just... they overcharge you because they only need one conviction. Right. Even if I was convicted on the lowest offense, uh-huh. they could still give you the max for that. That's what right. they do. They overcharge. Wow. There's no federal trial where it's just one charge. Yeah. They no, had your things. Not. Of course. But we not. won the um, lying to a in- postal inspector's charge. Okay. Jury didn't like that. Um, I testified for two days. Uh, it was just a whole big scene out of a movie. Courtroom was packed every day. It was me and my lawyer on one side, and they got 30, 40 people files they make it this whole big show wow and it's not guilty it's not innocent until proven guilty it's guilty until proven innocent of course it is you're fighting for your life up there yeah you You took the federal government to trial and i didn't do just that i'm running a club where they're trying to get it closed down every day they're going to federal court saying you need to close this club down the judge is like he's not doing anything illegal he's entitled to work they tried to revoke my bond five times because of the club stuff they started blackmailing me with the local um, ambulance to say I needed to start paying them three to four grand to have an ambulance and EMS stationed outside the club. So they were they were getting money by when someone would go to the ambulance for over drinking, like pre gaming, mm-hmm. and then I would pay them. A federal court ruled that that was illegal what they were doing yeah. because by law they have to show up if someone gets hurt. Mm-hmm. Do you think this would have happened if you were in a bigger city? Where there was actually real crime and problems. Like if you were in New York City, Mm -hmm. do you think they, you know, you would have a packed courtroom? No, I don't think I don't think it ever should have been a federal case. I think someone had some connections and pushed it along because the feds normally do millions of dollars. I mean, when you think about it, this is a four hundred and eighty five thousand dollar fraud case. Right. Right. The feds aren't doing cases like that. Right. No. And also, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't get their money back. I'm just saying it shouldn't have been on a federal level. Right. Think Did, about how much they spent. Right. Two More years of investigation, Crazy. a like, criminal trial, yeah. 10 times that. At least they spent that. a lot of money. So did, I, I'm curious, the people you borrowed money from, did they testify? Yeah. Did you have family friends that testified? Yeah, you said, but I did have family, but it always, so like my uncle testified on the feds witness list, but that hurt them. Yeah. Because he came on and said, he doesn't owe us money. And he's a doctor, so he said that child's mind's not developed. Individuals like that, a lot of their witnesses hurt them. Yeah. What happened was two days after the trial started or whatever, so my business partner, John, this is where he plays into it. I made a deal with him. I said, listen, always have my back. I won't throw you under the bus. I'll take the heat for it. Mm. But just don't go against me. He gets the best deal of his life. 
I think they put pressure on his aunt and uncle who are rich paying for his college. He gets an immunity deal to testify. Mm. He made their case because he was able to go on the stand saying that he was able to, as a co-conspirator or whatever, you can testify to my mindset. So he was able to say that we came up with this plan to defraud, which is total bullshit, but he was able to place my wow. mindset. He wow. cut a deal, got immunity, got probation in the state, did three years probation on a state charge misdemeanor, mm. and that was it. And that was the- And his restitution was $30,000, and, and that mine was, was the 400 hook, The hook, line, and sinker, if that's yep. what did it. Just one good- inside witness for the feds and that's all they need because we had like one do of you those, think you would have won if he they hadn't had him 100 percent. we had a great wow. trial i was wow. great on the stand yeah um a lot of their witnesses weren't like mind-blowing there wasn't individuals that came to testify that said they lost their house my lawyer was able to pull out of every adult that testified so there was two aspects one all the kids that testified my lawyer would say are you out any money and they would say technically no so that looked good with the jury mm -hmm. Two, all the adults that said they came and lost money. One, they were all well off. They weren't on the street. And two, my lawyer hit it home that, so did you only invest because of the 50% interest rate with a 17, 18 year old kid? Right. And they would all say yes. Yeah. And you should have seen the look on the jury's face, everyone. They were, it was not. Yeah. They looked bad. Yeah, that's a scumbag move. Yeah, you know, You're, he said this is child abuse. Yeah, he right. went crazy lakes to right. defend me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's lawyers' theater. Yeah, right there. It, it, it was a show. Wow, well, exactly. Was set, it was a concert. Exactly. It was crazy. Wow. So your boy lied. Do me right on it. And, and it ratted and lied. Yeah. Um, he saved himself. Did you? So you were found guilty. Uh, did they arrest you? Did they bring you in no, right there? No, so I was released back on bond. It's right. not like state court. Right. Um, released back on bond. I'm on bond. Ex sentencing keeps getting pushed. This is November now. Tried to revoke my bond a couple times. I lost. Mm -hmm. But now I'm getting back into gambling because the club shows the winter's slow season for the club, not getting good acts, cash flow s slow. I do what I do best. I go to the casino to start trying to make sure. money and I'm taking concert money and whatever just to mm. make money, but I'm not 21 yet. So I'm going out of state. Mm. Well, my supervised release rules are that you're not allowed to travel out of state without permission. At first I'm playing it safe. I'm taking a taxi cab. I'm leaving my phone at home or putting on an airplane right. mode. I'm paying all in cash. I then get lazier and I start using the business debit card, <laughs> and I start bring, having my friend drive me that helped me at the club, and all this shit. Over the summer, sentencing keeps getting pushed. This, I just turned 21. These guys that were helping me at the club that I thought were my friends call the FBI and say, hey, we know you're after him. We know how you can get him. They placed me at the scene of that casino out of state on like six occasions, gave him the dates, this and that. Their idea was they wanted to take the club from me and run it themselves. Right. They were having backdoor meetings with the landlord, all the sh They turned me in. The probation officer finds out, calls an emergency bond hearing. Judge revokes my bond. Now you're and, in the slammer. And this is October 2016. Go to a detention center in Rhode Island, a federal holding private mm -hmm. center and immigration center. Mm -hmm. 30 days later, get sentenced to three years in federal prison by the judge. Uh, what were you pressing for before you got you got your bond revoked? What was your lawyer uh, pressing for? So the like pre-trial negotiations. The feds after trial were asking for the guidelines after the pre-trial supervision report, like to show w what I qualified for or whatever, had me at 10 to 12 years. The feds were asking for seven to eight, the prosecutor, which was lower than the recommended guidelines because mm -hmm. they said it was warranted that there should be a downward departure because of my age and everything. And the old sentencing guidelines are way out of pocket. 10 to 12 years was crazy. Seven to eight years is yeah, crazy. So seven but, to yeah. eight. And then my lawyer was asking for house arrest. Right. House arrest probation. Right. I would have gotten that if I didn't get my bond revoked and pissed off the judge because he left me out for that long anyways. <sighs> and I had just gotten a job at Whole Foods. I was paying money back. Like I, the club was my downfall. I should have walked away from that, but it, it was a blessing in disguise because I needed to be physically removed from that club. <laughs> to, to, otherwise, and COVID, even Why? if I- Why? Because you had an attachment to it? I like had an you, attachment. It wasn't a great business and I yeah. need to, time heals everything. So by re removing me from that situation for three years, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. So the judge met in the middle. Yeah. He gave me three years 
and one year house arrest and three years supervised release. Right. So we're talking four years tied, seven yeah. years. With you know, paper and everything. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. That. I was 21. That is an odyssey. That is an odyssey. And you know what? We're going to switch over now on the Patreon just to, you know, because you've talked so much about prison, but I want to hear a little bit of it. We won't spend that long, but uh, I just want to wrap with like some thoughts. So, yeah, I mean, I love it. I love it. I mean, you made mistakes, but it's like I, in some ways, envy young entrepreneurs like that. Like I, I, I didn't really have that. Uh, I, I was a, you know, a drug dealer that just got lucky. I was just like a small time punk who just was in the right place at the right time in many ways. But you like, God damn, from the beginning, uh, such a, such a business minded individual and you love the creative aspect of it. You know, you love putting things together. Look what you've done, you know? Yeah. And you couldn't have done it. You couldn't have the prison brand without being locked up. So I needed to go to prison to have what I have now. Prison was yeah. the best thing that could ever happen to me because that's what makes me different in a way. This whole time I'm yeah. chasing difference and the thing yeah. that got me sent to prison because I was different helped me create being different even more. That's right. That's right. And I, I remember that too. You know, sometimes I have to remind myself like that's why people know who I am. That's why people know my comedy is because it started with my prison experience. Wow. And what about your parents? Like, you know, there had to be some healing involved. Like your, your poor parents were in bed when the feds raided, like you were a meth house. <laughs> did that yeah. relationship, did, uh, I, I mean, what was, what was going through their mind? Were they under a tremendous amount of heartbreak and stress? I think they just felt my pain. I mean, they saw me suffering. They saw the weight I was putting on. Yeah. Always under constant pressure and stress. Like yeah. I don't, you know, even to this day, I don't think there's a day that goes by where, like, I'm not under pressure. I've been under pressure since I was, you know, this started since I was 17 years old mm. because now it's the pressure of making things right, you know? So you're still paying off restitution. Yeah, I pay $1,000 a month now. Wow. How, <laughs> how, how much are we down? What do we have left to go? about 400 left. Oh, my yeah. God. Wait, how much? What was the total? 485. My business partner paid 30. I mean, while I was getting on my feet and stuff, I didn't pay a thousand, but now I just worked out a deal with them where I'm paying a thousand. Right. My goal is to get like some type of big deal, whether it's a TV gig or something that I can negotiate it. Say, Hey, here's 250,000. Right. Here right. you go. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's knock this That's off. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and if the victims, right. Uh, are amenable to that, then the government is good with that, right? Exactly. You okay. go to the victims first gotcha. with, through a lawyer gotcha. and you all come up with an agreement. How many victims were there? I think there's 12. 12. Um, 12 or 13 on paper. What was the What was the maximum, the highest investment? Henry's was 225,000. Right. Henry, and that was the lowest? I think 10 grand. Was there anybody that you were close to that you fell out with because of the money? I mean, I was close with all of them, you yeah. know, or at least I thought I was. I mean, you realize though that some people never really were your friends because money yeah. shouldn't change that aspect. Right. If they were like, I meet people now where, you know, like, cause now I got, I'm like traumatized by money. Like I don't want investors. Like it took me years just to get into a spot where I have an investor in this. And like, I'm very cautious. Like if I say I'm going to pay you on this date, like when a vendor sends me an invoice, but I have to pay it right then. Yeah. I don't like playing with money whatsoever because I don't want to be in that position. You know, I don't want to borrow from anyone. I just, it just reminds me too much of the past. You don't want to owe. Yeah. And I'm like in this business where it's good, where it's, it's not like a, it's just the type of business where you, you don't need that, you know? Yeah. But I also knew I needed to take on a partner to grow right. in that sense. But I realized, like, I have a great partner now yeah. who, like, he offers to help me with things. And I never got that help from these individuals before. Right. Right. So were they ever really my friends? Yeah. You know, because money shouldn't change that. In well, that money will change that if there's not an apology. But mm -hmm. a friend a friend could be mad. I could be mad at you for you lying about what you did with my money. Yeah. Uh, but if you come and apologize and be like, hey, I was just too ashamed to tell you that I, I lost <laughs> it on, on a, a legitimate investment. I, I was really trying to make you money. I, as a friend, as a reasonable person, should say, that's okay, I understand. But my problem was I never did that until it was too late. So it wasn't genuine because I had lied so much that they got so pissed off the point where they turned to the law enforcement. And by the time it was time to apologize or whatever, it's 
it's too late. Yeah. Did your father advise you to go apologize before these people went to the cops? They had already gone to the cops by the time my dad knew. I got it you. It already put everything in And there in was motion. no call in the dogs off then? You couldn't have made nah, an apology this guy, then? This, this, this detective was after it. So you think even if the people, the victims had uh, forgiven the debt, by the time the case got rolling, the feds would have gone after you anyways? I think that a lot of these individuals they were promised by law enforcement that they would get their money back because they didn't know what was really going on. They could have thought I was hiding the money, genuinely stole. They didn't know. They just yeah. wanted an honest point of view. Right. The feds promised them that honest point of view and their money back. Well, the feds lied because they weren't getting their money back right then and there because there was no assets. It was all lost. Yeah. And so I think by the time this thing eventually went to trial, from like the gist of conversations and stuff, these people didn't want to be involved with it. It was water under the bridge. Right. I don't think these people, ha the people that have hatred for me right now are the people that were kids that I went to high school with that are not owed a dollar. Right. The people that lost money, they don't hate me. Right. They went on, they made more money. They yeah. know I'm trying, they know I'm yeah. doing things, but they're not out bashing me. Right. The people that repost bad articles about me that hate me for what I'm doing now are people that I went to high school with that didn't like me to begin with mm -hmm. or never or not owed any money mm -hmm. that those are the people that talk badly about right me. right right yeah if you had been a rich man like if you had had houses and things to trade you, you probably would have avoided you know the case but that shows your intent if i had that i was genuinely trying to steal from these people right those jet skis i bought i had for three weeks and gave them to a pawn shop for seventy five hundred dollars because yeah. i was trying to pay off another investor mm -hmm. and didn't realize all i had to do was make the minimum payment to get the jet skis, like to keep paying the right. minimum. Pawn shop took advantage of me and I lost the jet skis. $22,000 jet skis I gave up for seven grand. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, the feds wanted you. The feds wanted you. Yeah. And they're still dicks. Like in the HBO documentary I did, yeah. like they're just nasty. Yeah. Like they think I'm literally Bernie Madoff, Johnny. What a, losers. Aren't these supposed to be intelligent people to get into the FBI? And you wanted to get, you wanted to be part of the FBI. I met Imagine with that. the U.S. attorney last week at just about restitution. Yeah. Nasty. Really? Just like bulldogs. Really? And it's just like, there is, I interview people on my channel that have been convicted of fraud mm -hmm. and they're skating the system and they're trying to not pay it back because they genuinely defrauded people. Yeah, yeah. They're paying pennies on the dollar a month. They don't right. give a f And here I am trying to do yeah. the right thing right. and paying a lot and you're trying to scare me. They literally said, oh, you know, like you could get resentenced to prison. And my lawyer was like, no one in this 50 years of practice has ever been resentenced to prison on an old case where probation has expired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, that's how they're still trying to play. Like, you're scum of the earth. Yeah, I. I Look at Jordan <sighs> Belfort. He yeah. owes a hundred billion dollars. He's got yachts and, and mansions. And that's right. That's it's right. crazy. That's why it's better to be a scumbag. I will never be like that, though. My mission <sighs> is to pay everything back, including yeah. the street people. Everything. That's my goal. Yeah. Wow. See, they you, they plan on getting their money back. If, if the way I look at it, I need to make about seven hundred fifty grand. Yeah. To make everything right, to write everything. Yeah. And I that's attainable will. in a lifetime. I think you will. No, so I think I'm, you'll make millions. I think you'll make millions faster than you think. And when I'm it comes, trying. it comes. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's. I, I hear stories like this about the FBI, and it really what like Vec Ramaswamy is the you know the Republican who's running that wants to like cut the FBI like by like seventy percent. Yeah, it you, I mean it makes a little bit of sense because it's like these people have no respect for the Constitution, for the Bill of Rights. They really don't. They operate like a Gestapo, and it's uh, so you think yeah, it's like there's just too much bureaucracy at the top. It's like it's it's all becoming just a big money pot, and uh, it's you know they're bulldogs. There's an argument for yeah. there, you know, and, and obviously you need, but you need the FBI for like, you know, these horrendous things that go on. So mm -hmm. it's it's just it's tough, man. But yeah, you gotta you gotta cut them by a lot. You gotta. It's like, man, it's it's wild, and a lot of people are bitter too. They they don't want to be. They want to be like your defense lawyer, five hundred bucks an hour. That too, you know, and they don't have the balls. They live off taxpayers' monies. But anyway, <laughs> wow, we've de we've uh, we've uh, uh, detracted. So, well, look, dude, I uh, man, that's that's something, Ian Bick. What'd you learn? It's the biggest thing you learned from uh, from this whole odyssey. Um, I mean, there's a lot of lessons in the story, but I would say like the biggest ones are, you know, be patient. 
I think I made a lot of my bad decisions because I always thought things needed to be figured out in the moment. Mm. And had I just waited and thought things through, I could have chose a different avenue and explored right. options. And I wouldn't have made bad decisions. Right. And also everything's going to work out exactly the way it should. You know, every little bad thing that happened to me would later turn out to be a blessing. Sometimes we just don't realize that mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, so those have been very important things I've taken away. Amen. And also just never give up. Yes. Like ever. You That's keep right. pushing, you're going to beat out 90% of the people. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it matters way more than talent, for sure, yeah. or smarts. It's persistence. It's, you it, know? Dude, it's a grind, man. In our industry, you know, yeah. how many people, you know, they're afraid to get into YouTube or comedy or whatever. Yeah. If you're consistent, you don't miss a day posting this and that. Yeah. You're going to get somewhere. Yeah. Something will happen. Can't get discouraged. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Amen. Okay, buddy. Plug away. Plug away. Well, Johnny, thank you for having me on the show, man. People, you know, could find me just at ianbick.com. Yeah. Um, you know, see my YouTube mm -hmm. channel, Ian Bick. We we interview people. Uh, we have two episodes a week. Um, that people that have been to prison or former former addicts that have been able to turn their life around. Um, and yeah, ianbick.com has all my social media. That's it. That's it. And maybe in the future you'll be touring with the podcast. Who knows? There's, yeah, we're working on live shows right now. There's a lot of things. You got a lot of stuff working going on. Working on a book man. too. <laughs> oh, you are? Yeah. Getting the book. It, it's I've redirected to it to be mainly about prison because okay. that's what I built my platform on. So it's proof right. of market right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to be focusing on those prison stories. Okay. Well, click over to the Patreon because I want to hear some of those prison stories. And uh, yeah, go follow Ian. And uh, I can't wait to do the live show on Sunday, man. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guys.